Thank you very much. Uh, the biggest thank you, if any, is to Jesse Revivo and to the family that without them, obviously, I wouldn't be here today. So I thank them very much. And I hope you all going to, yeah, they deserve it. And Baruch uh, Hashem, I already have been here in Toronto a few, few times. And uh, hopefully it will be many more times in different uh, topics, different subjects to different audience. And tonight, since I've seen that there's a mixed crowd, we have beginners, we have you know, more advanced people, I will, I will uh, merge three different lectures into one to try to satisfy everyone. <laughs> it's not that simple. So we we'll start, you know, we progress as we go. So we're going to start for the beginners in the first third. Then we move into the mediocres. And then we'll finish with the atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, as Jesse just said, uh, there's a very common mistake among 80,000 religions and cults that started after Judaism. And I answer emails not only to Jews to Muslims, to Christians, to Hindus, Buddhists, anti-religious, communists, male, female, from different parts of the world, even terrorists, even people from Pakistan that work with machine guns, they send sometimes emails. It comes to the same bottom line. All the other religions and cults besides Judaism is based on belief only. You either believe it or you don't. When you ask the religious authorities in other religions to prove their point, to prove their books, their answers without hesitation. Uh, spiritual things cannot be proven scientifically. You either believe it or you don't believe it. Religion is something about belief. That's what they answer. The priests, the Qadis. You know, it's interesting. It's amazing sometimes how far the ignorance can travel that those Qadis and priests which believe in our Torah and they agree that the Jews received the Torah in front of millions of witnesses, somehow they didn't see in different places in the Torah that the request from a human being, not only from the Jews, from humanity in general is to know God, not to believe in Him. To know him, to know he's the boss, to know he's the creator, to know he runs the show, to know that every leaf that falls from the tree, if it goes left or right, needs his approval. Nothing can move an inch in this planet or any other place without his approval. And the request, the obligation is to know 100%, which means 99% it's still a big problem. Why? 1% doubt, it's a lot. 1% doubt, it's already having, uh, you're having some hesitations. Should I do, should I not do, maybe it won't work out. So I want to relax everyone here, those who still have doubts, that in the next two hours, God willing, hopefully it will work as it usually works. Everyone here in this room that still have a doubt if the Torah is divine, if it's the work of Hashem, if it's the work of our Creator, in the next hour, you don't really need more than 20 minutes, but to be on the safe side, two hours maximum, you will have a hundred percent knowledge, not belief, knowledge, like he said, believing means not knowing, that the Torah is divine. However, still not guaranteeing me anything. I travel from New York, I come here, okay, I prove my point. What's the next step? Now it's depend on what kind of human being you are. There are three different kinds of human being. Let's focus on two different kinds. Some people, as soon as they see that the Torah is divine, their life will never ever be the same. From this moment on, everything, with no exception, is going to change. Of course, it cannot happen overnight. We are not robots, we are not angels, it takes sometimes years. But the person realized every second of my life until now was all mistake. I'm heading to the wrong direction. I must make a U-turn and start correcting what I've destroyed in my life. However, the other kinds of people are 
They listen, they're very impressed. They come, they give the compliments after the lecture. Some of them will even send an email in two. And two, three days later, they go back to their normal life, every day's life, and the lecture actually never existed for them. They forgot about it. They move on with their life. Some people, unfortunately, I'm talking from 15 years experience, some people will remember the lecture, actually will be forced to remember the lecture, God forbid, I'm not wishing bad to anyone, don't misunderstand me, but I'm just describing the situation. They will remember the lecture and the proofs that they saw could be a year later, could be five years later, when God forbid some kind of a tragedy happens in a person's life, unfortunately then he begins to realize why God is doing it to me. When the IRS is sending a letter to come for an audit, everyone is religious. When somebody, the doctor says we have to check if you have cancer or not, everyone is religious. When people, God forbid, had a miscarriage or they cannot have children, they're religious. When they are not religious, when they manage without God. I'm okay for the time being. Why should I bother now? Rules, obligations, allowed, not allowed, leave me alone, let me be free like a bird flying all over, enjoying life. The idea is not to be a fool, to be wise. A wise person learns from other people's mistake. Why should you have experiments on yourself? Learn from other people's mistake. Just give you a story that happened. In New York, last Shabbat, there is a very famous, I'm not going to mention names, but in New York, when people will watch this lecture on the website, everybody will know who I'm talking about. Tens of thousands of people. And there is a very famous restaurant in Brooklyn. Everybody knows that restaurant. Perhaps the most famous restaurant for Israelis and American Jews, Glad Kosher restaurant. My parents are religious, there's a guy, 23 years old, he works there, he's running the show. Just two days ago, three days ago, I got a phone call. Did you hear what happened on Shabbat? What happened on Shabbat? The guy, the son of these owners of the restaurant, took his motorcycle on Shabbat and drove somewhere, and an Atzala truck on an emergency call came full speed and hit him and killed him instantly. Just when he had a baby girl, just when his marriage started a year ago, and now all of a sudden everybody in Brooklyn wants lectures. Can you come tonight? I was invited tonight. Last night I was invited. Tomorrow I will be invited. But I'm here. But all of a sudden everybody remembers, remembers Hashem. The idea is not to be a fool. Don't remember after it's too late. The idea is right now, when you are successful, when everything is running perfectly beautiful, no problems, you are married, you are happily married, even though it's very rare today to be happily married, unfortunately. <laughs> what can we do? That's the situation. I always say to my students in yeshiva, you're all complaining that you're single. After you hear 1% of the complaints I get from the married people every day, you, you thank God a million times for being single. But there's always an exception to the rule. So the idea is, like I said, let's really start. The idea is, please, all I'm requesting from each one of you is when you go home tonight, don't forget what you saw here. It's not about me. I did not write it. Some of the things I may show you, you may not like. I'm going to show you tonight things that you may hate very much to see. When a person goes to the doctor and the doctor told him, God forbid, he got cancer, he hates the doctor. It's normal. Why you gave me such a bad news? It's not the doctor's fault. It's the doctor is has, doing his job. He has to show him what's the situation. A good doctor tells the bad truth right into your face. Doesn't, take, doesn't tell you, take two Advils, everything will be fine. <laughs> With doctors like this, you don't need doctors. A real doctor say, my friend, I like you very much, but if you don't stop smoking today, tomorrow will be too late. Not next week. And he bothers you, and he push you. Maybe he's gonna save your life. So the idea is, I'm going to prove a few things tonight. One, for those who still, it's not clear to them that Hashem exist and he's the creator of the world so we're going to prove that after we prove that God is running the world and he made the world in us and everything around us 
then the next step is to link him to the Torah. It's not necessarily means, as one thing to prove that God exists, who's to say that the Torah is his word, maybe the rabbis made it up. So that's the second step. After God willing, we prove that the Torah is 100%, not 99, 100% divine. Then the third part comes, which is the most important one, is to understand what's the purpose of this creation. There is anybody here in this place tonight that it doesn't bother him to know the purpose of his existence? Did you ever see in life a normal human being that it doesn't bother him? What am I doing in this world? 6.4 billion people, so many people running around, business, marriage, children, animals, food, all kinds of things. What am I doing here? The creator that put me here, what does he want from me? Why did he give me seven years of life? Why I'm healthy and my friend just died? Why I missed the plane and my friend got on a plane and he died and I got saved? Why I got married and I have children and my brother doesn't or the other way around? Why so many people in this generation, almost every family have such tragic sicknesses, among them cancer and heart attacks and all kinds of things. Just in the last 48 hours, hundreds of people are dying all over the world from a new epidemic. When I came here today to Toronto, only two days after, everybody here in the airport is with a mask. Everybody. Why? There is a new flu now. It comes from the pigs. I'm not surprised it comes from the pigs, <laughs> but everything that Hashem does has a message. Now people are breathing germs, viruses in the air, a regular flu, but it's a different one, it's mutation. Some things that became a little bit different than the average flu from the animals, and already in Mexico 80-something people died, in New Zealand, in England, in French, in even one case in Israel now. And you know, it's like multi-level marketing. One become two, two become four, four become eight, eight become 16. In less than a minute, you can have hundreds of casualties. So that's how it works. Who's to say? In 1919, 50 million people died in the world from a flu. From something like that, 50 million. Now remember, there was no six billion people in the world 100 years ago, nine years ago. So a very large portion of humanity just died in months. So many things can happen in this world with, this, with the scare of the atomic bombs that so many countries already have it. When I can show you a clip of a Qadi speaking in a mask and telling his believers that their goal and their dream is to bring anthrax from Mexico into the United States and in one minute kill 330,000 Americans, which September 11 would look like a joke compared to their plans bringing one suitcase from Mexico to America. And that's, they speaking about it in the internet, in front of the FBI, in front of the Secret Service and all the other authorities, clearly, everybody can see it. Then obviously, every second that we are alive, it's a big, big miracle. But we don't appreciate it because we are not aware of how many dangers are around us. Let's go back to step one. I'm going to skip about 20 minutes from the first part, which is the difference between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Right there in my suitcase, you have my English videos. It's called Torah and Science. It's a three hours film, divided to three. The first part is the difference between Judaism to all the other religions and cults. And not only that, it's how do we know for sure that the Jews stood around Mount Sinai and received the Torah from God. Since I don't have an hour to speak about it, I'm going to speak about it about four or five minutes and then we move on. Just that you know, when somebody asks you, what's the difference between Judaism to all the other religions? They all claim they have the truth. Everybody dreams, the Muslims, the Christians, the Hindus. The main difference is that every other religion and cult started with the story of one person. Not one of them, not of their leaders, none of their prophets was able to bring one witness to back up his story. When Muhammad came from the desert, 1400 years ago and claimed that Angel Gabriel gave him the Quran, he did not bring even one witness to his story. When Buddha came 2400 years ago and said that he saw the light, he did not have one witness. When, uh, when uh, Mary 
got engaged with Joseph and Joseph went away and he came back after a few months and he saw that she's pregnant and she had to tell him a story because if she wouldn't make up a story she would be executed. Because in the old days they, used, they didn't give prizes to ladies that cheat on their husband. Like today on television they bring them on the stage, give her the first winner prize. And she's, uh, you know, I mean, she's proud of it. In the old days, a woman that cheated, you know, she had to run to the end of the world to hide. You know, when back in the days, the people still had conscious. So she had to make up a story. What is she going to tell him? Her fiancé comes back after a few months. See, she's pregnant. So she told him, I'm a virgin. God came to me in a dream and made me pregnant, and my son will be the Messiah. And how many witnesses she had to her story? Of course, not even one. Nobody can back up a dream. So here you go. The three main religions, Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam, starts right away with 50% doubt. However, Judaism, which is 3,300 years ago, Islam is only 1,400 years old, Christianity, 2,000 years old, Buddhism, 2,400 years old. Torah, Judaism, 900 years before Buddhism, 1300 years before Christianity, and almost 2000 years before Islam. That's quite a while, you know, it's not, we're not talking two, three months here. The Muslims make all kinds of uh, foolish arguments. For instance, they say, we don't believe exactly the same Torah you have today, that this is the original Torah. So what's going to be our answer to them? Make a little bit of a better argument. Why? Because the Torah was already spread all over the world for 2,000 years before your religion even started. Millions of people already saw an original copy of the Torah. You cannot call all of them back and now change it and modify the Torah because you want to change some things inside. Plus, God was very strict in his Torah. He said, if you're going to change one letter from our Torah, What's the punishment for that? No tolerance, no forgiveness. Why? You modify the divine Torah? It's a tragedy. Change the face of humanity. It's a holocaust, spiritual holocaust, to change one letter from a divine book. So to claim that the Jews call all the books back and start changing them, when actually it wasn't Yitzchak that Abraham went to slaughter, it was Ishmael, all kinds of foolish arguments. It's really below a joke. It's really a joke, so let's move on. So now, one story of one person. However, the Jews got the Torah in front of 15 million witnesses, approximately. It could be 10 million, 12 million. It's not clear 100% how many millions, but without a doubt, we're talking a very large number of witnesses. When you come to a non-religious human being today, when today it's very easy to be religious, because technology you know, circumvent most of our problems. In the old days, to, to be Shomer Shabbos was a, a very large mission. You know, you have a lot of things to do today. You have timer for this, electric stove, it cooks for you, the elevator works for you, everything works for you, light, on and off. Very easy today. So, when you come to a non-religious person and say, I want you to take this book and become fully religious, what's the chance that he will agree? Close to zero. It's going to make excuses. No, I cannot, you know. How is it possible that once in a history, millions of people, a whole nation became ultra, ultra orthodox? That until 200 years ago, it was almost impossible to find a non-religious Jew all over the world. You couldn't go anywhere in the exile all over the places in the world and find Jews without a yarmulke 200 years ago. It was very rare. Beard, everybody had. Even the communists and the goyim, they all had beards. They didn't have Gillette yet. So they all had, you know, beards. As a matter of fact, I saw in one of the books from 100 years ago that somebody shaved with a special cream before the razors. And everybody on the market were pointing at him and said that he's a woman. <laughs> Which shows us there was a very rare occasion to see somebody without a beard. It was a big thing, like 4th and July fireworks. Everybody stands to see somebody without a beard. Look, that was only three generations ago. So the world was different. The ladies, of course, were all modest. You can, re you can read by Rashi in France 900 years ago that Rashi writes that all the non-Jewish ladies used to watch 
their modesty in different ways, of course, than Jews, but still nothing to com compare to today. The world was a different place. So all of a sudden, a large nation, all of, all of them became ultra, ultra orthodox. When you review the 613 laws that the Torah has, it's very interesting. More than 80% of them are against human logic. When I want to be a faker, and I want to bring a book to my nation because I want to be the leader, because I want them to give me donations, fame, glory, to admire me, to listen to me, I like to play the judge. You know, there's many reasons why people fake a religion. Because I want to be the leader. People give their life to be the president of the United States, money, career, they give up just for the glory, for the fame, for the honor. So I want to be the leader. So I write a book. I'm faking a book. I'm coming to millions of people. Attention, please. God gave me the book. All of you have to obey 613 laws. What is my chances in the first moment that they will even listen to another word of mine? When I say such a number, 613 laws. <laughs> Go find your friends. Do us a favor. <laughs> we have a, it's sunny today. So that's one problem to begin with. By the way, 613 laws, because the body of the human being is created with 613 organs, 248 organs, 365 ligaments. For, a, for each organ in the human's body, it's one positive mitzvah in the Torah. For each ligament in the human's body, we have a restriction in the Torah. 365 restriction, 365 ligaments, 248 organs, 248 positive mitzvah. The Kabbalah says that when the soul exits the body and goes on the way back to the court of heaven, it will happen to all of us. You cannot escape it. The, moment, the point is to get there ready, not to be very surprised. So when a person goes there with the soul, exit the body, the soul looks exactly like the actual physical body. There's only one difference, there's no material. So if you try to grab a soul, you cannot feel any physics, because it's spiritual, it's like an energy, divine energy. And the soul goes back to heaven. Before the trial begins, the Kabbalah says, you can look at the image of the soul, the 248 organs, 360 five ligaments, and you can see which mitzvah this Jew kept and which mitzvah he ignored, which sins he used to commit, which sins he used to be very careful with. Before the trial begins, you can see empty spots. And that's how the Torah is a tool for a Jew to sanctify himself and to pass the test that God set for him in this life, which I'm going to explain soon, that he will get a positive mark that he should cash out on his reward, or God forbid, get punished for his sins. It's up to him, free choice, 100%. So when I come to a large group, look how many things are against me. First, it's a very difficult book to keep. Sacrifices, all kinds of things, it costs money, it's different than to be free, you know, and you have a lot of obligations. Second, 80% of these rules are against human logic. When a person wants to convince a large nation to become religious, and he knows he just faked a religion, what's his incentive? To bring a difficult book to keep, or a very easy to keep? A very easy book to keep. The harder the book is, the less chances that people agree to cooperate. If you bring him five, six rules, be nice, be modest, uh, you know, don't cheat on your wife, uh, one day you pray two minutes, you give one seir five dollars donation, you know, don't kill, don't steal, very good, that's the religion. And make sure that you know that I'm the prophet, guy gave me the book, every question you have, you have to come to me. <laughs> and you have to build me a palace, big deal, it's going to cost you a dollar each, what do you care? You know, I need a Rolls Royce, I want two horses, I want, you know, another house in Miami, one in Toronto, that's all. That's how they all do, the cults. So what's the problem? Each one of them will give five dollars, end of story. Plus, there's almost nothing to keep. None of them will go against me, because I just gave them a very easy book to keep. But when I bring them a book that they just found out that they have to get divorced, what does it mean? 
just moments before the Torah was given, many of the Jews, remember, they were the Hebrews. They just came out of Egypt after 210 years of slavery. They came out of Egypt in Pesach, two weeks ago. And seven weeks later is Shavuot. They received the Torah seven weeks later, so almost two months. Within these two months, Moshe comes and gives them the book. Now, they, when they see the book, first thing they acknowledge is that they, many thousands of them has to get divorced. Why? Until now, you are allowed to marry your father's sister. Your father has a beautiful young sister. You're older than her. She's your aunt. You're allowed to marry her. All of a sudden, you open up the book that you just received, and you found out you have to get divorced. Why? The Torah say you cannot touch your aunt. She's against the law. So, wow, thousands of people that have to get divorced will say, yes, Mr. Moshe, everything you tell us, we're with you 100%. Or they're going to get their swords and go into a war to destroy him before a minute. It's going to be too late. The more this guy is breathing, the more danger we are in. We must kill him. He's our biggest enemy. Why? He just told thousands of us we have to get divorced, we have children. Second problem, thousands of people, they just slaughter the cows. It's ready for Shavuot, for the holiday. They just found out that the way they slaughter the animals is not kosher. Why? They just received the book. They didn't know yesterday. You have to use a special knife. You have to check the knife. It has to be smooth. You have to know where to cut the throat. So what happened? Thousands of cows. Each cow is approximately $10,000 today, just to give you an idea. 15 million people. How many cows do they need? Thousands. Thousands of cows has to go to the garbage. There were no Arabs to sell them halal meat. <laughs> there was no Islam yet. So they didn't know anything about halal. The Arab ate everything that moved. <laughs> so what do you do with millions of dollars? You have to throw them to the garbage. So, many problems. Then when they begin to see the Torah, they see a very interesting mitzvah. What is it? If you find a mother, a bird, in the nest, you have to make sure you get rid of the mother and take the chicks away and put them somewhere to die. And thanks to that, you're going to have long life. It's called mitzvah shiluach haken. You get rid of the mother bird, you take away the eggs or the babies, you put them somewhere, Thanks to that, I guarantee you long life in the next life. But it doesn't matter even in this life. Where is the human logic here? It's against human logic. It's called Tsar Baale Chaim. What, what, cruelty. What did the bird do to you? What do you want from the bird? Leave the bird alone. So now when the people read in a book such an obligation, they would love it or they will ask millions of questions. If a person is a faker, he's not going to put such a mitzvah in a book. Why does he need to get himself into such trouble? He can make a lot easier mitzvot. You should not steal. Everybody understand. It's logic. You should not kill. It's logic. It's logic. Human logic. Where is the logic that you have to make sure you don't have chametz in your house for seven days? No breadcrumbs on the floor. Who cares? Especially in the days of the desert when it was all dirty anyway. So you have some pieces of spaghetti on the floor, in the sand, in your tent. So what's the problem? Maybe a piece, a little bit of beer spilled somewhere under the bed. What do you care about this? Excuse my language. I'm trying to make it extreme for you to understand what I'm, where I'm heading to. It sounds very foolish. If I'm a faker and I'm bringing it, to try to fool millions of people, I will never put such a mitzvah in my, in my book because the people will send me to a mental house. A minute later, this, this guy is crazy. It's not a messenger of God. Believe me, there are hundreds of mitzvot like this. All the sacrifices, hundreds of mitzvot are to kill animals. Is this logic, human logic, to take a goat and slaughter him because I made a sin? Where is the logic here? I made a sin, punish me. Why you punish the goat? Why you punish the cow? Let's conclude this part. The Torah 
80% is against human logic. For those of you who thought maybe a faker brought it, or maybe the rabbis made it up, get it out of your head. Why? It's impossible. The more you learn the Torah, the more you see that these laws are above human. It's way deeper than human understanding. And not only that, the Torah says clearly, don't try to analyze my laws and understand them in your brain. My ways and your ways are not the same. Your ways compared to my ways is like comparing an eagle to a worm on the floor. That's what the Torah says. So get it out of your head. You and me are not equal. I am the creator and you are the creation. A creation does not understand the creator. So if you don't understand the logic in the laws, it doesn't mean you're allowed to ignore it. Then we move on. The Torah says to the Jews, all of you heard God and Moshe are speaking. Moshe is speaking and God is answering from the mountain, from the fire. If one of the Jews did not hear the voice of God, as Moshe just served them the first Torah scroll for the first time in history, and they opened it up and they read inside the text that all of us, with no exception, heard the voice of God speaking to this gentleman that just gave us the book. Now, who knows better than us what just happened to us today? We know the best, no? You know what happened to you. Nobody has to tell you what happened to you. So when I read the scroll that just came from heaven, from the mountain, and I read that I am the main actor in the movie, it tells about me. You and her and her and him and everybody heard God speaking to the person who brought the book. So what's the answer? Don't we know if we heard the voice of God or not? It's enough that out of millions of witnesses, one Jew would raise his hand and say, excuse me, Moshe, with all the respect, you're a very nice human being, but you are hallucinating. I never heard you and God speaking. It says right in this book that you claim that God gave it to you. If God gave you a book, obviously this book should be mistake-free, no errors. It's divine. God doesn't make mistakes. God knows what happened yesterday. And what's going to happen a thousand years from now? So in the book it says that we heard you speaking to God. I never heard you speaking to God. End of story. The Torah says all the Jews heard God. All of us. I did not hear. End of story. Before the Torah even started, it will be over. Why? Here is our first mistake. It says that all the Jews heard. They would not accept it. Why should they accept it? If there is a mistake inside, of course. So the rule is like this. If there is one mistake in a book, we could never ever rely on this book. Why? It brings us into many doubts. Maybe it's not divine. Maybe it's a mixture of divine and human. How would we know if to fill in is not the second mistake? How do we know if marriage is not the second mistake? Today we know it is, but <laughs> how do we know then that it's not the second mistake? Don't get me wrong, marriage is the most beautiful thing if you know how to do it. Part of the Torah, a large part of the Torah, teach the men how to treat the wives like a princess, holidays, gifts, help in the house, treat her nice, understand her depression before the labor, after the labor, and many other things. If a man would learn the Torah advice about marriage, 90% of the marriages probably wouldn't, wouldn't go into effect. People get divorced today because they never learn how to get married. I have said in one of my lectures in New York, and I got a lot of good responses about it, that if I had the money, I would open up the first college in the world for marriages. <laughs> Just college to come to learn how to be a husband and how to be a wife. And you think it's gonna be a month? No, it's gonna take a long time to learn. You know, have no idea how many things is to learn. The psychology of the woman, raising children. In today's world, it's almost impossible to raise children with all the Game Boys and the Internet and all the dirty stuff that the kids see and what happened in school with the drugs and all the things around behind your back, what the kids do behind your back when you sleep and you think you have great kids, you have no idea where they are traveling. You have no idea. 
One time the, 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 the Rosh Yeshiva of the school, of a, of a very strict Yeshiva, one of the best in America, calls me up and says, I want you to come and see what the kids are doing. You never believe what they're doing. You have no idea what religious kids, because kids are curious. It's enough that one bad kid enter a good yeshiva, it can destroy hundreds of kids. The danger is tremendous. You invest millions of dollars in your children, you send them to the best schools. One day you fell asleep, your life is over. You don't know what's gonna come out of it. Plus, the intermarriage, it's an epidemic. Most Jews in the world marry non-Jews. The Jewish people are shrinking. Only 13.2 million Jews all over the world. We and the Chinese started in the same generation. When 4,200 years ago, after God, Hashem, got very angry at the world, 4,200 years ago, he brought a flood, as you read in Parashat Noah, and millions of people died in the time of the flood. They all drowned. Only eight people got saved, Noah and his sons, three sons, and the wives. One family got saved from the whole world. And from then until now, we have 6.4 billion people in 4,200 years. The dinosaurs died, many giant animals, the Torah said they could not enter the ark, so they all died. And there's a lot to learn about it. One thing we should know, 900 years later, the descendants of Shem, which is the Hebrews, which later became the Jews, is us, received the Torah. Nobody else did. Somebody that hated Jew, his name is anti-Semite, because we are the children of Sem, which he is the son of Noah, the righteous one out of three. Yefet in Hebrew means Yofi, beauty. In English they call him Jeff. It loses the, the name loses meaning. <laughs> Jeff. Whatever it means. But in Hebrew, Yefet comes from the word Yofi. Yofi means beauty. So the Europeans, which America came from Europe, you know, the Irish, the Dutch, the British, they all came to America and New York. What is this? They brought York from there to here. New Amsterdam. They came, you know, so they got the beauty. And then there is the third son, which his name was Ham. He was black. And he went to live in the area where it's very hot. Ham means hot. And they all went to Africa. So all the, Af the African areas, the country came from this son called Ham. And Sam is the Jews. The Jews came from Sam. And later it's Abraham, it's Hak and Yaakov, and then we received the Torah. So rule number one, if there is one mistake in a book, you cannot rely on it. As I told you, I have in this lecture usually mistakes in the Quran that leaves no doubt that this book could never be written by God. It's a joke full of errors. I don't have the time, you can watch it in a movie. Then I have also proofs in the Quran that the Holy Land belongs only to the Jews. In the Quran. That's what's great about it. From their own book, you bring, you bring proofs that the, the Holy Land belongs only to the Jews. There was no Palestinian nation until a few generations ago. No flag, no anthem, no nothing. They, all of a sudden, it became a nation. It was all Arabs living here and there. All of a sudden, you have a nation. They never had a country, an army, a government, a flag, nothing until recently. Not only that, inside it says that Muhammad tells the Muslims, if you ever have doubts about God's truth, go to the Torah. The Jews receive it before us, and they are more precise than us in the Quran. <laughs> Many interesting things. The land that Allah gave the Jews and made a covenant with them. And Musa, Moshe, Moses, same thing. And stories about the destruction of Pharaoh in Egypt in the Quran. And Muhammad says, I'm not coming to renew anything that the prophets before me said. I'm only repeating what they said, which in reality they call him Prophet Muhammad, and believe it or not, he never gave one prophecy in his whole life. There's not one prophecy in the Quran. But the Muslims all over the world scream, Prophet Muhammad. Prophet means somebody who gave a prophecy. What's going to happen in 500 years from now? Like the Jewish prophets. He never gave one. Not one prophecy. Among them all the mistake. Here is the Quran. You can see it inside. The, the New Testament is a lot worse. It's full of errors almost in every chapter. 
and human errors, and the best part is that the Christians and the Muslims, they agree that the Jews received the Torah from God. They just think that God gave a second book. And obviously, if it's the same God, and he gave part one and part two, part two could not contradict part one, right? It has to be the same name, the same dates, the same families, the same event. It cannot be a different story. So when you review the New Testament, many of the stories in the Torah, they miss, right, the names of the people. They made a mistake. They name a phone, they change it to somebody else. The dates is different. The Torah said that Jacob went to Egypt with 70 people. All of a sudden, in the New Testament, it says 75. What happened to God? He forgot how many people Jacob had in his family. Many mistakes like this. That leaves no doubt that the New Testament is a human book full of errors. Going back to the Torah, let's see some of the things about the text. The text, it's very interesting. If you go all over the world and you ask the rabbi to take out the Torah, right here, you go to New York, you go to Israel, you go to Iran, you go to anywhere you go, whenever you see Jews, show me the Torah. 3,320 years ago we received the Torah. Perhaps hundreds of thousands of copies were written in all the exiles until today. Maybe tens of thousands, it doesn't matter, it's a very large number. We still have the same Torah. If you are in Syria, it's Bereshit Bara Elohim Tashamayim Vetaaretz, it's the same story. You go to Iran, it's the same Torah. You go to Poland, you go to Russia, you go to America, to Toronto, it's the same Torah. Even though the Jews were all over the world, such in Yemen and in Europe, Jews didn't know. For instance, Ashkenazi Jews could never dream that there's black Jews on the other side of the world. And the Yemenites, if you show them an Ashkenazi Jews with blue eyes and blonde hair, they would never agree, believe that they're Jews. Come on, you're kidding. They cannot be Jewish. But you ask them, take out your Torah from your bag. Take out your tefillin. Take out your mezuzah. Show me how you do Brit Mila. Show me how you make matzah. All the same. With no internet, no telephones, no communication. Two different planets, two different worlds, 2,000 years of exile. They just reunited in Israel 50, 60, 70 years ago. Same Torah from A to Z. Same Rambam, same Gemara, same everything. Now, when you go to check the Quran, hundreds of different Qurans. Here it's Mustafa, here it's Ahmed. What happened? You have to make up your mind. Over here it was Haman and Paro, over there it's a different name. Nothing makes sense. So many mistakes. New Testament, more than 150,000 different texts. More than 150,000 New Testament. Which one is the original one? You will never know. It's gone. What's the point of wasting time with this? Torah, one Torah. Now, you have to remember that all the Gentiles were doing everything they can to destroy the Torah. They didn't allow the Jews to learn Torah. The Jews were not allowed to learn in the Torah on Shabbat. They made all kinds of decrees against the Jews, and yet the Jews kept the original Torah. The Muslims and the Christians had a freedom of choice, freedom of religion. When you ask them to show you the original New Testament, the original Quran, they just don't have it. It's gone. They will never know. So even, even if God gave them something, it's gone. What's the point? The books that they have now, it's full of errors. So it's not divine anymore. For those who didn't know, if you want to send the Torah from Israel to America or to Toronto, and you don't find any volunteer to carry it. It's not so easy to come with the Torah 12 hours in a plane. So you want to send it UPS. What are you going to do? You're going to send the Torah in the UPS? They throw it like this with all the boxes? All you have to do is make sure one letter is missing. The Torah doesn't have any, any holiness. One little yud, or even half of the yud is erased. Half of the yud is erased. The smallest letter, the Torah is not divine anymore. Why? It's been modified by 
low lives like us, excuse my language. We became God all of a sudden. We changed God's, God's Torah. The Torah has no holiness. What's the big deal, Rabbi? We understand the meaning of the word. One youth is missing. It's not divine anymore. And that's the difference when you make mistakes in the Torah or not. Now, for those who didn't know, in front of you, uh, as I say, 1300 years before J.C. Penny was born, <laughs> and 1800 years before Muhammad was born, the Torah already told us, soon I'm not going to be able to say it because they're going out of business, I have. <laughs> so I got to catch as much as I can. <laughs> oh, at least they have good deals now. Oh, anyway, <laughs> anyways, so the Torah comes and tells us, you the Jews are a stubborn nation. Let's see the words of God to us 1800 years before it's going to happen. Right in front of you, for those who understand, if not, I'll translate. I will spread you in all the nations, and only very few of you will survive. Very few. <laughs> you will not live long there. Your existence will not be long. Why? As God is directing you over there in the exile. Exile, it's include Toronto in it. New York, Brooklyn, everywhere. Only a few of you will survive. Remember, we started with the Chinese people in the same generation. They are close to 2 billion and we are 13.2 million Jews. Not even 1% of 1% of the Chinese people. In 4,200 years, it's nothing. And you will follow a man-made God. The God of the wood and the God of the stone. What does it mean, the God of the wood and the God of the stone? What's the symbol of Christianity? Knock on wood. Many Israelis say, knock on wood. They don't know it's Christian custom. Knock on wood, cross your fingers. All these things is Christians, okay? So if you hope something good will happen and you go like this, you probably make it not happen. <laughs> Be careful. Ignorance is the biggest threat when you don't know what you do. So the Torah said, the God of the wood. What is this? Christianity. Don't have to believe me. I'll prove it in a minute. Then it says the God of the rock, the God of the stone. Which one? Islam. If you look at the first yud, right there on top, you count 50 letters. There's an equal mathematical hidden skip inside the text. Hidden in an equal mathematical order. It's not coincidence, cannot be, because there are thousands of codes like this. Not one or two which leave no doubt that this is a divine book. But that's a whole new topic, codes in the Torah. You can watch it in the internet. <laughs> so the Torah says, what are the other symbols of this religion? Yud, 50 letters. Shin, 50 letters. Vav, Yeshu. Yeshu is JC. Yud, Shin, Vav. There's another meaning to it. Maybe it's not the time to mention it. So... What's the other symbol? Islam, right? Where the Muslims have their special tomb, the special rock? In Mecca, in Saudi Arabia. You have the letter Mem. One second, where it is? Here we go. Mem, Chaf, and Hey. In equal mathematical skip, Mem, Chaf, and Hey. In equal skip, Mecca. Yeshu and Mecca appear inside the text in equal mathematical skip code of 50 inside a verse that's speaking about two phony religions, Christianity and Islam, Yeshu, Mecca, wood and rock. Coincidence? Can it be 1800 years before Islam started that the Torah will put Mecca inside the text in equal mathematical skip and call it a foreign religion? And what's the outcome? Only very few of you will survive. Why? Because you left me. You betrayed me and follow those false religions. Now, I don't have the time, really, to explain what happened to the Muslims and to the Christian and to all the other books, 
How is it possible that they have so many different texts? But briefly, just for those who catch it quick, this is the way it is. If right here, in the middle, you have Muhammad that wrote the Quran. On the right side, number one is Said. Said copied the Quran from Muhammad with one mistake. From 100,000 letters that the book has, it's obvious that you're going to make at least one mistake because you write with a feather and the ink. It's a long walk to write such a book with a feather. So you have to make at least one mistake, if not 100 or 200. But let's go for the minimum number, one. So that's Said. Then Mustafa copy it with also one mistake in a different place. How many differences we had between Said and Mustafa? Two already. Right away, two different versions. We have Muhammad is one, Said has a different version, and Mustafa has a different version. But it's only one letter. Multiplied by 1400 years of people copy one from another. Now you understand why the words are missing, different dates, different names. And obviously you cannot follow it. But the Torah, Baruch Hashem, is the same Torah. Let's move on. The Torah says, this is the first proof for tonight. Go and check in the history. From the time God created Adam on earth, from one side of heaven to the other, did anybody ever come to testify that me, God, spoke to him from the fire and made magics for him like I did to you in front of your eyes in Egypt? Show me one group of goyim, of non-Jews, that even claim, just claim, even lying, just claim that me, God, spoke to them in public or even in the desert anywhere, but few people, not one, few, five, ten, twenty, a hundred. Show me in a history once that a group of goyim claim that me, God, spoke to them. That will be the first mistake in the Torah. To write such a thing in a book, you cannot ever take such a risk. Why? So many millions of people out there. You know everyone comes and make up phony religions. All it needs that Muhammad would bring five cousins to testify that angel Gabriel gave him the Quran. Even if they lie. If he bribed them, I want you to say that the angel gave me the Quran. That will be the first mistake in the Torah. Because the Torah says there will never be a group of goyim. Never. Only one individual. But never two or three, because two it's already a testimony. One, it's nothing. It's his story. No, no nothing to back it up. But a group of witnesses, I, God, will never let it happen. Never. 3,320 years. Not once one of these going thought to bring a group of people to back up his story. 80,000 times they started a book with the story of one person. 80,000 times the Torah was right. Who could have write such a thing? Now I move on. The Torah said, as I said before, you should know I'm your God. You should know today. I took you out of Egypt, your heart should know, the nations should know. Always the language is to know, not to believe. One time the Torah wanted to speak about belief, the Torah said in the bottom, Leman tidu, you should know and believe me and understand. First to know, then to believe, and then maybe you understand or you don't understand, it's no problem, as long as you did. But always knowledge comes before everything. Now when I'm Analyzing my body, I have five senses. I can smell, I can see, I can touch, right? With the five senses that I have, I can prove that God exists. So how can I prove He exists? Very simple common sense. Every creation has a creator. The more organized is the creation, the more sophisticated is the creation, it indicates about the brilliance of the creator. Not one human being in the world is willing to swear that the laptop was made from an explosion. It was made by himself. But they are willing to say that the whole world was made from a random explosion. This, yes. The whole world, yes. All over. The little watch, impossible. Are you crazy, Rabbi? Come on. 
everywhere you go, colleges, books, television shows, the whole world, boom, explosion, something happened, I don't know, a hurricane, all of a sudden, brains, 10 trillion connections inside the brain, the dumbest person in the world is more sophisticated than all the laptops together. People don't know. Size of the computer inside your head is like an apple. 80% is liquid. The veins, the, the, the wires inside the brain, take a thousands of them, combine them together, it's one hair. That's how thin they are. And they're all inside that liquid, one inside the other. It's so complicated. And there are people who stand in the best stages all over the world. When the Bing Bang happened, there was an explosion. Everything started to shift 300 trillion years ago. I have two ways to prove that the scientists are wasting our time and selling us baloney. The long way or the short way? Which one you prefer? <laughs> the long way will take four hours. I'll explain about extrapolation, about calculations that they do, carbon-14, and, you know, the rest. We don't, we're not interested in this. The other way takes exactly 30 seconds. We go to the conclusion, to the results, to the bottom line. The bottom line is there are thousands of scientists, thousands of universities all over the world. They all use the same methods, the same formulas. They use the same language. They even have the same professor. One learned from the other. Each research about the age of the world ended with a complete different results than the other. One scientist said the world is 10 million years old. His friends from across the street, from a different university, say 300 trillion years. When you ask them which way you calculated your results, the same thing. So how is it possible? Not one of them came with the same results like the other. Why should I waste a minute of my time reading their garbage? Why? If 10,000 scientists are standing and they all claim they are the best in the history, and among them Stephen Hawking, that sold us his garbage for 20 years and then later on came on CNN and said, everything I told you is nonsense. The world is created from a pea. A green pea, believe it or not. That's what he said. Now he's, he's dying, you know. Le'ilu nishmato, it will be the pea. <laughs> no, I'm serious. So what's the point? 20 years you're selling us books, now you're coming and tell me that we were created from a little green pea? <laughs> Why did I waste $100,000 a year for my children to go to college? So the answer is, listen good. If each one of them come with a complete different results, obviously in the best scenario, maybe one of them is right, out of thousands. Do you have time to start investigate which one of them is right? They're all assuming. It's all called speculative science. There are two kinds of science, objective science, speculative science. Speculative science, everybody speculates. They have missing things that they cannot calculate, and they make up a number. And that's why each one of them come with a different number. If you don't believe me, just read. There's a good book, Beyond Reasonable Doubt, and there's many good other shows about it. In my website, I, may, I made sure to put two videos of a goy, goyim, not Jews, that investigate the age of the world and came with one conclusion that the world is only a few thousand years old, like the Torah says. And they prove, they disqualify all the other theories. A very interesting film, you want to watch it, divineinformation.com, watch it. Gentry, Robert Gentry is a very famous scientist. He proves the world is only a few thousand years old. Now you may come and ask, wait a minute, what are you talking about? We thought we are here for billions of years, you know what, who cares? Why people are so interested to know the age of the world? Like, like it's going to, we're going to benefit in any way. If it's 5,000 or 5 million years. Why? Because this is not obligates me to do anything. Why, why do I care? I admit this, I admit that. Once it begins to obligate me to change my habits, I got to make an argument because I don't want. Now let's move on. Here. I'll give you one example. You all heard that there are few things that the Jews are allowed to eat. 
even though unfortunately most of them don't care about these laws because they don't understand it. Uh, you know, people ask, why am I not allowed to eat pork? What's the difference between pork and a cow or a goat? The answer is, there are many, many reasons for it. But one of the reasons, just to give you an idea, every animal, when they eat something, they finish to digest it between two to four hours. We, it takes us six hours. Human being, it takes him six hours to finish digesting his food. The animals, the kosher animals, it takes two to four hours to digest all the germs and all the dirt that they eat. So once they digest it, it doesn't stay in the system. It's a life risk things that they eat. Some of the things they eat, for us, it's a life risk. The pig that lives all the time inside his garbage with his nose, he eats everything, even his, his own bathroom. Whatever he just exits from his body, a minute later he eats it. Delicious ice cream. How do you call it, Jesse? <laughs> Deep and that. Deep and that. Oh, excuse me, that's insulting your company. Uh, for the animals, he eats it right away. It also looks like balls. What the people don't know is, what the people don't know is, that it takes the pig 24 hours to digest it. So when they kill him, they shoot him. They don't slaughter him and put salt for all the dirt to come out. They just shoot him or electrocute them. They put them on a special pla 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 you know, like a special floor. They electrocute them. You have a thousand pigs. Just come and cut them and eat them. And you eat everything that they have inside. And that's very, very unhealthy. Not only that, People say, Rabbi, I went to a glad kosher restaurant and ate a steak. I paid $15 a piece. The other day I went to a non-kosher restaurant. I bought the same beef steak, $4, $6, whatever, $7, half a price. And you know what? The non-religious one was much juicier. Now please give me one reason why I should pay double for a dry steak. So I have to explain him why the juice in the, the steak in McDonald's is very juicy. Why? <laughs> because when the Jews slaughter the animal, they cut the front of the neck, and they have two cords. All the kosher animals have only two cords in the front, not in the back. It's interesting. So the Torah says you must cut them in one shot with a sharp knife. In less than a second, they don't feel any pain. The rest that they move, it's reflex. It's the nerve system continue to move, but they don't, they don't have any pain anymore. The non-kosher animals have two in the front and two emergency cords in the back. That's, by the way, proof that the Torah is divine, because who could have known 3,300 years ago to list which animals are kosher and which one are not? And that only the kosher animals have two cords in the front, but the other ones have four. So the goyim used to make an argument. Hey, you're very cruel with your slaughtering. You're cutting the two cords, but the animal continue to receive blood into the brain from the back. It's very cruel. So the Jews proved to them that only the non-kosher animal have reserve cords. The kosher one don't have it. It's very interesting. So now, why the steak in McDonald's is so juicy and it's half a price? <laughs> When yet the rabbis have to slaughter a cow until they check that the cow is not defected, nothing is broken, there's no hole in the lung, so many things to check. And the, that the lung is smooth, there's a lot of things. Finally, they slaughter the neck. They put a lot of salt within 72 hours because after that, then it absorbs inside the organs. It's impossible to get rid of the blood. And all the liquid comes out of the body of the cow after a few hours from the salt. Tons of salt they put. Why? To get rid of all the liquids. What liquids? The blood, which the Torah forbidden, that we're not allowed to eat the blood because it's the nefesh of the animal. It contaminates the soul of the person if he eats it, but people don't know it. So the Torah says, put the salt to get rid of it. Get the blood out. Ki adam wa nefesh, the Torah says. And what other liquid the salt clean from the body of the cow? All the urine, the pee, the, the bathroom. Every cow that you open the stomach of the cow has enough liquid in the stomach to go to the bathroom, what you make in six months. <laughs> you can fill out buckets of the liquid from the cow. Now, when they go in electrocute the cows or shoot them, 
they don't shoot anymore. Usually today it's electrocuting them. They are hours laying down on the floor in hot weather, cold weather, it doesn't matter. Bugs, flies, everything. They are laying there for five hours, seven hours, ten hours, depend how many workers they have. In the meantime, all this pee in the bathroom and all the other things begin to absorb inside to the meat, inside the, 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 the body of the cow. So when they finally cut the cow to steaks, it's very juicy because you eat all the, <laughs> the body, all the body exit and the dirt of the cow. That's why it's half a price and it's very juicy. Marinated in bathroom liquid. You understand? Now let's see what the Torah has to say. Shh. The Torah say, this is what you allow to eat from everything that lives in the water. Which water? The Torah does not specify. 72% of the world is water. How deep? 12 kilometers. That's what we found. It's a lot deeper. So the Torah says, you want to eat kosher fish? Kosher things, species from the ocean, two conditions, two witnesses. It has to have fins and scales. If you see in the body of that fish fins and scales, I allow you to eat it. I created you, I created that fish, I allow you to eat it. If it doesn't have fins and scales, you're not allowed to eat it comes the oral Torah, which was given to us together, and say an unbelievable statement. Everything that has scales must have fins, guarantee. How many kinds of fish we know? About more than 40,000 different kinds of fish, species. There are millions of different species in the ocean. The Torah say, dear Jew, you don't have to know them by name. You just caught something in the ocean, look at him. If it has scales, it's kosher. Why? Even if it's cut, let's say a shark ate half a fish. He ate the tail. And now you see only the head with a little bit scales. You don't see the fins. Don't worry, it's kosher. Why? The oral Torah promise. Everything that has scales, for sure have fins. I know I made them. Don't tell me how. I know. Guarantee. First of all, what human being can write such a thing? 3,300 years ago to guarantee such a thing? Until this moment, nobody in history found one species in the oceans that have scales and didn't have fins. To write such a thing, you have to watch the entire creation simultaneously to see all these millions of things moving inside the oceans and to guarantee there is not even one that have scales without fins. Which means if we're going to find one snake with scales, snakes don't have fins. They just have a long tail in the back. One snake we're going to find with scales that you scratch the body and the scales are falling out like, this, like the fish has, God forbid, will be the first mistake in the Torah and we'll have a very serious problem. Why? Here you go, it's not divine. And this is the oral Torah for those who have doubts. Oral, Rabbi, I believe in the written. The oral, it's a different story. You know, the rabbis made a little bit alterations to it, God forbid. It's all about ignorance. People that don't know the rules, they make up all kinds of assumptions. Comes the Torah and says something even nicer. The Torah says, how do you know which animal is allowed for you to eat and not? How? Two witnesses. Everything in Judaism foundation is two witnesses. So we have fins and scales. We got it over. Okay. What's the next thing? Split hooves. And chew is cut. Mafris parsa umalegera. Check in the leg of the animal. If the hoofs of the animal has a cut inside, then it's a one sign. Second sign is that they chew their cud. They reprocess their food. The food comes out of their body. 
and either from the front or from the back. Some animals get it from the back and then they swallow and, and eat it again. Some from the throat. Once they redigest food that was already in their stomach, that's what we call ma'alegera. Chew is cud in English. Now here is the interesting thing. The Torah say, dear Jew, today we know more than two million different kinds of animals. Two million. Think about it. Put a list of animals. One, two, three, until tomorrow. <laughs> For all the way from here to Zimbabwe, you have animals one next to the other, and you won't end. The list is endless. Two million different kinds. Now you have to know them from inside and from the outside. And every rule has an exception to the rule. Some of them are defected, unique, different than the normal. You have to know all of them to write in a book that there are only four exceptional animals out of two million. Two million. Only four can fool you. Be careful. There's a warning in the Torah. Four animals have only one sign, not two. The camel, the pig, the rabbit, and the hare, which looks like a rabbit almost. Four out of two million. Why do I tell you this story? If one person will bring another animal today, yesterday, tomorrow, it doesn't matter and come and show to the world, look what I just found. I went on a trip in Brazil, in the jungle over there, and we found this animal. And this animal has split hooves, but doesn't chew his cud, or the other way around. There will be the fifth kind. The Torah say only four kinds. Four out of millions. Not five, not seven, not two. Four, and it's divine, it must be precise. If one person will bring another animal and say, Dear rabbis, here, another animal, one sign, that will be the first mistake in the Torah. It's not divine. And you know what's the best part? Right next to it, it says that the Jew has to put the feeling on his brain and on his heart every day. Right next to it. In the same divine book, it's not two different gods. Same one who gave us a divine book with all this knowledge, same one told us in the Torah, Banim atem Hashem elokechem. You, the Jews, are my only children. I chose you from all the nations to be mine, because I loved your father, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Do me a favor. Don't behave like the Gentiles. Why? The Gentiles made so many despicable sins in front of me that I got sick and tired of them. If you don't believe me, it's right inside the text. Et kol ato'avot ha'ele asu ha'goim ha'ele va'akutzbam. For those who understand Hebrew, they can back me out. Cats in Hebrew mean end. I had it with them. Not only that. Inside the Tanakh, it says something shocking. I wish the Jews would know it. Then maybe they will appreciate themselves a little more. Because the Jews are always busy trying to imitate the goim. Should be the other way around. But this is the point. The Torah says, and some of us say it in a prayer, but we don't understand what we say. Even the Israelis don't understand, even though it's Hebrew, because it's an ancient Hebrew. The Torah says like this, And goim kamar midli, ukeshachak moznaim nechshavu. I repeat, the goim, the Gentiles, for me, they are like the drops of the water that sticks to the bucket after you brought water from the well. But you, the Jews, are the actual water for me. It's an analogy, a mashal. What's the mashal? Again, let's say it in simple English. A person went to the well. He brought a bucket of water. That's how it used to be until 50, 60 years ago. People used to bring water from the ocean, from the well for laundry, for drinking. What does the person do after he brings the water into his home? He spills it into a special uh, bath or something, sink, whatever. What does he do with the bucket? Throw it on the side. Till the next time he's going to go to the well. 
Did you ever throw a person runs to the bucket and lick the few drops that sticks to the side of the bucket? Nobody cares about it. They just throw it. God says to us, if we are Jews, none of us can guarantee 100% that he's a Jew, unfortunately. It's very hard to know today, especially in this generation when the Israeli government brought so many going to Israel to try to make more Jews supposedly against the Arab population, 80% of them are not Jewish. And they already have children that grew up like Israelis, but they are all non-Jewish souls. It's going to be a spiritual holocaust for us. Because when we want our children to marry Jews, they will never know if their soulmates are really Jews. How are you going to ask this Russian immigrant where your grandmother was in Russia? 50 years ago. Was she Jewish or not? Go and prove now. Very difficult. Only the religious people, the ultra-Orthodox, will be able to make sure that their children will stay Jewish. The non-religious have almost no chance to make sure. There is a higher chance that their grandchildren will be goyim. What Chiloni wants his grandchildren to be goyim from the descendants of Adolf Hitler? Nobody wants. But they do things without realizing what they bring to their descendants. This was the decision of the Israeli government. I'm not going into politics. I'm just trying to bring a point that's reality in Israel today. You have about two million people in Israel that are non-Jews. They go to the army. Some of them sit in Israeli Knesset. Some of them even go to yeshiva. Nobody knows. They go in. It's impossible to know today. Go and investigate the source of all the people who came from India and Russia and other countries. Very big problem. So the Torah says, and the Jews for me are the water, and they are the drops. This is the word of God. I didn't write it. It's not my opinion. Don't get mixed here. And then the Torah continues. When you go to the Israeli market, they scream. Watermelon, two for shekel, three for shekel. You ever go to the market in Israel? How they scream, they put their heart into the screaming. <laughs> one guy, he was trying to teach his son one pasuk from the Torah. Torah tzivalanu Moshe morasha ki'ilat Yaakov. That's what he was trying to teach him. Two weeks, the boy doesn't learn it. Two years old, three years old, whatever he was. Then, the next day, you know, in Israel, the people who sell watermelons, they have a horse and a carriage, and they come with a pile of watermelons, and they have very loud voice. Evolution, you know, they walk, so they scream, so they develop a very great voice. So they scream, Avatiyach al -asakin. For those who are Israelis, they know what I'm talking about. The whole neighborhood, no matter where you are, you're snoring already. You hear this guy, Avatiyach, you must go down. All the neighbors come down to the street, a hundred people, watermelon. In one minute, the watermelons are gone. The guy heard watermelon, watermelon. Two minutes later, his little baby begin to say, watermelon, Avatiyach, al -asakin. Two weeks he's trying to teach this kid one pasuk, he cannot learn. All of a sudden, two minutes, the next day it bothers him very much. How can it be two weeks I'm trying to teach him one pasuk? I couldn't do it. Hundreds of times. One time he heard Avatiyach al he came. He went to the rabbi the next day in the shul. Rabbi, what is the secret here? The rabbi said, ah, very, very obvious. The Torah says, Dvarim ayotzim min alev nichnasim el alev. Hashem promised us something in the Torah. When you want your words to go into the person's souls, direct, express. No connections in Atlanta for two days there to stay there. <laughs> no. Directly into his heart. You have to speak with passion and, and emotion. You have to show him that it kills you from inside. It's burning like fire. And it doesn't matter what you say. It could be a fool. It doesn't matter. When you see you speak from your heart, it makes great impression inside. If you speak like a cold ice, dry ice, whatever you call it, it doesn't go in because the guy in his subconscious doesn't catch the message because he looks at your sign, it's your body language. It doesn't make the impression. So the rabbi told him, 
The guy that scream, watermelon, watermelon, he's thinking about his mortgage, about paying for tuition, he owes market, money in the supermarket. When he scream, Avatiyah, he's thinking, my life is on the line, I gotta feed my children. He went directly into your son's heart. Because this is words that are coming out of the heart. When a person screams, it goes from the heart. The Chafetz Chaim, a hundred years ago. Chafetz Chaim was a very famous rabbi. The Goim made a bad decree against the Jewish community. All the Jews were depressed, crying that they couldn't practice religion. A danger to the entire Ashkenaz community in Radin. The Chafetz Chaim never knew any language besides Yiddish. He didn't know Polish. No Hebrew, no Polish. The Goim don't understand Hebrew anyway. So he has to go now to speak to the Tsar, Nikolai. He goes to this Polish prime minister, whatever he was. Finally, they got him an appointment. And they brought an interpreter to translate to Polish. Hafez Chaim was a very short man, very small. He went inside the meeting and began to speak Yiddish. Speaking, speaking, crying. Five minutes. And the interpreter, the Goy, that understand, he wants to now translate. But the Chafetz Chaim speaking and speaking. All of a sudden, the Goy, which, which wasn't crazy about the Jews, he made the decrees against the Jews. The Goy said to the interpreter, okay, tell the rabbi the decree is canceled as of now. No decree, I'm canceling it. So the interpreter said, hey, sir, I did not translate one word of what he was saying. The guy said to him, hey, you don't understand. I don't need you to translate what he says. This is an international language. When I see words coming out of the heart of this old man with tears, he probably say good things. It's okay, goodbye. The decree was canceled. Thanks to that, maybe we're here. Chafetz Chaim with his books, Mishnah Brura. Who knows what would happen if the decree wouldn't be cancelled. Five minutes later, after the Chafetz Chaim came out from this building of the governor, two Jews are running to him in the stairs. Rabbi, we're looking for you from the morning. What happened? He said, we build a synagogue together. It was a hundred thousand rubles to build the synagogue. That's the way we calculated. Now I just found out that it's actually 150,000 rubles, but my partner didn't tell me. He went out of his pocket and gave another 50,000 rubles in the building. So now he has two-thirds in the mitzvah, and I have only one-third. I want to give him back 25,000 rubles. He doesn't want to take. I'm begging him a week already. He doesn't want to take. He said, I already gave it. I gave it. I'm not going to take my donation back. I gave it. Give somewhere else. But it's not fair. We want to do the building together. He didn't tell me. So the Chafetz Chaim started to cry again for the second time. So now I understand why I had such a siyata dishmaya from Hashem. I had such help from Hashem. I, the guy didn't even understand one word of what I was saying. Like a magic. All of a sudden he canceled all the decrees. When Hashem saw two of you on my way to look for me, and what are you coming to argue today? It's the other way around. You have to pay. No, you, you have to pay. You didn't give enough. A hundred years ago, it was different. So the Chafetz Chaim said, I can swear on my life that the reason the decree was canceled it was thanks to your two Jews. When Hashem saw that he has such children. And that's what the Torah says. The Torah says, you go to the market. You see the guy screaming. Tomatoes, cucumbers. What? He has a piece of metal. Wait. One kilo. One kilo, it's a thousand gram. Go to the Israeli market and tell him, I want to measure, I want to weight this weight that to make sure that it's really a thousand gram. It will never be a thousand gram. It will be 999, 998. Why? Because the corners of the weight, after a few years, they become round. You know, they get they rubbed off. Yeah. So it's 999. So who cares about one gram? The Torah say this is divine words. Remember, it's not me. It's the Torah. You, the Jew for me, is the weight. He is the crumb, the cookie, the piece. 
from the corner that fell into the garbage. It's words in the Torah that the Christians and the Muslims say this is the word of God. We don't have to back them up. They know. In the book that they teach in the, synagogue, in the church and in the mosque, same Torah. Where do they know the name, the name Ibrahim from? Yusuf. Where they got those names from? Why they don't eat pork, the Arabs? Why they don't take interest? They learn it all from the Torah. They don't deny it. Where they learn the name Angel Gabriel gave Muhammad the Quran? When did they hear about such an Angel Gabriel in the Torah? Same thing the Christians. Inside their books, they read that God said to the Jews, you are my children. And what are we doing? Speeding in the face of God every second of our life. You cannot deny it. Who can raise his hand and say that he's, uh, he's not ungrateful? How many times he say thank you that he's able to walk, to see, to enjoy taste, to have a wife? Everything you have, you take for granted. Did you ever think that 15% of the Jewish people in the world cannot have children? And you are lucky you have three, four, and you complain about them all day? 15%, I know some of them personally, 17 years, I know. Running from one treatment to the other with frustration and tears and agony and depression and pain. To have maybe a daughter or a boy. They will accept anything, fool, ugly, everything. You? Mm -hmm. Why did you do this to me? My son is not John Travolta. It's not fair. <laughs> it's not handsome enough. I'm, ang I'm angry. I'm angry. Not to talk about husbands that say other stupid things in front of the wife. Everything you say in front of your pregnant wife, your baby listens to you. A hundred percent. Most abortions in the world are done in the third month of the pregnancy, when the baby is a complete human being, with pulse, with nerve system, he already tastes flavors, he already anticipates danger, he is very intelligent, and he's only the size of a quarter. They made an experiment. They pinched the baby in his nose four times. Every time they pinched him in his nose, he moved his, he his head to the left. By the fifth time, the world, the scientific world, got shocked. Before the needle came to the nose of the baby, after 90 days of pregnancy, the baby moved his head to escape from the pain of the pinch. Before, he has pulse, taste, brain. He see the danger is coming. He knows in one more second I'm going to get a pinch. He knows how to protect himself. Two million Jews like this were murdered in Israel from the beginning of Israel until today in 60 years. Two million we kill with fruit the garbage. Why? Because it's not convenience for us, Rabbi. We, have only, we already have three children. How can we afford to have another one? Ignorance is a big danger. If you would read in the book of God that God says, you are not feeding your children. If any, sometimes they feed you. Why? Every baby that is born, the Torah say, comes with his budget in his hand. Why you don't see it? Because it's entered into your annual salary. You know, what do you think? You go to work, you make half a million dollars a year, you make it for your stomach? Don't be so sure. When the first boy came, he brought 50,000 a year. That's his parnasa. He's an, he's an individual. He's a human being. You're not the only one in this world. We also need the bread and a basket of wealth. When the second one came, he got what he deserved. Sometimes you're very poor. You have one son. You're still poor. Second, third, fourth, fifth. Maybe one of them, his fortune to become a millionaire. All of a sudden, you become a millionaire thanks to him. But you think it's thanks to your talent, to your business decisions that you make. And the truth is that you don't know that this baby that just born brought you all the money because he's supposed to live a comfortable life for his correction of his soul. It's very complicated. I don't have time to speak about it. All these things go into my website. I have more than 300 lectures there. Everything you want to know about life is there. Right, Toledano? It's there or not? Yeah, you approve? Very good. 
Then the Torah says that I'm skipping a lot, but I please encourage you to take this Torah and Science DVD. Obviously, it's a three hours there, and I want to mix a few lectures. So the Torah says the renewal of the moon to the precise number when the Torah was given to us 3,300 years ago. This is what the Torah says. Yeah, you have to listen to this. It's amazing. If, in case you still have doubt if the Torah is divine, I think we should do it right here. The Torah says that according to Judaism, the Jews go by the year of the sun and the moon. The Muslims go only by the moon. The Christians go only by the sun. The year of the sun is 365 days and six hours. The year of the moon is 354 days. So that's 11 days and six hours difference between the cycle of the moon and the cycle of the sun. The Torah say to the Jews that Passover, Pesach, must be always in the spring. Chag Aviv, the holiday of the spring. But we have a big problem in a calendar. Every three years, three times 11 is 33 days. And six hours, three times six hours, it's another 18 hours. So it's almost 34 days. The holidays, every three years, move by a month, approximately. After 20, 30 years, the holidays move from the spring into the winter, into the summer, into the, you know, to all the other four seasons. But the Torah, it's the word of God, and it must be correct 100%. So how you overcome the problem? Passover will move every year by 11 days until it will move into the winter. And since the Torah called Pesach the holiday of the spring, imagine that it falls in December. Here is the first lie in the Torah. First mistake. Judaism is over. Why? It's divine or not divine? It's not 99.9%. Has to be 100%. It's divine. We go into the oral Torah to see what God told us about this problem. Without the oral Torah, you cannot move one or two inches. There's no understanding whatsoever about the written Torah without going into the oral Torah. Nothing. You only have the names of the 613 mitzvot and not even one detail how to keep them. For instance, if you want to make tefillin, you have about close to a thousand steps from the minute you slaughter the cow until it becomes tefillin, the skin of the cow. One year process. And then people complain that it costs five, six hundred dollars. Rabbi, six hundred dollars tefillin? You guys love money, I'm telling you. <laughs> Just pay for the leather seat in his Mercedes, seven extra thousand dollars, made in Pakistan. But when a kosher, holy person in Yerushalayim walk a year to make a tefillin, it's $250 for the cases. One year of work. Rabbi, you greedy. That's why I don't like religion. <coughs> One guy came to Rabbi Silver in Cincinnati. An old person. He knows Yiddish. He comes to synagogue on Shabbat. The Rabbi, Rabbi Silver, said that this non-religious Jew, 70 or 80 years old, whatever he was, he reads everything. He knows Yiddish. He knows how to pray, but if, in the end of the davening, he takes the kippah, the white kippah, and put it in a basket. You know those kippah that fly with the wind like a feather? <laughs> how did you know I'm not religious, Rabbi? <laughs> I see the, the kippah, you know. Anyway, there's one guy try to pretend he's religious every morning and come to the synagogue to collect. So how do you know he's a goy? For five years, every day he comes, every morning, you see him, six o'clock, seven o'clock, he's there from morning to night, go from one person to the other. What does he say? Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. <laughs> For five years he's there, that one Hasi told him, change your words, today it's not Shabbos. <laughs> good Shabbos, good Shabbos, Monday, good Shabbos. <laughs> None of them tell him that everybody will know that, all right. So the guy, the Rabbi Silver, comes to him and says, why are you not religious if you know the laws? So he told him, how can I be religious after what I saw in the camps in the Holocaust? 
So the rabbi said, what did you see? He said, when I was in a camp, the Nazis used to make us stand 17 hours in the sun without food. One little piece of stale bread. We ate a day, and you had to stand 17 hours. If you move an inch, they shoot you. That's how it was. For days like this, many people just fell on the floor. They couldn't stand. They shoot them. If you move a little bit, they shoot you. Now you have to imagine what's going on here. He stands like this 12 hours already. He's back. His brain, his stomach. How can you? A healthy guy cannot stand 12 hours. Uh, it looks like a, like, a, like a stick, like a broom. Very skinny. I stand like this, and his best friend next to him just got a bullet in his head. And he's not allowed to look. I have to stand like this. He's describing now what he used to go through. So he says, but even in this condition, I was standing in a first row. And my, son, my friend behind me is calling me Fischl. It's five minutes before Shkia, before sunset. So I say to him, so what do I care now, sunset? We stand here until 10, 11 o'clock at night, until they want. They don't care what time. So I say to him, we didn't put fill in today yet. That's what on his mind, 12 hours, 14, 17 hours from the morning. It's five more minutes for the day. Once it's going to be night, I cannot put fill in. I miss the covenant between me and God for one day. Tfilin, the Torah said, So that's how we went. And there was one guy in a camp. He had one pair of tfilin. Nobody had tfilin. They took them out of the room. No tfilin. One pair of tfilin he had. It was a treasure. But he didn't let the Jews put the tfilin unless if they pay something for it. It wasn't for free. You have to give him a cigarette, a potato, a slice of bread. So one time I saw, five in the morning, we're freezing. We are dying from fear. Maybe the Nazi will come and see us putting tefillin. He'll shoot all of us in a second. It's a life risk. And make no mistake, they are not obligated to put tefillin in their situation. The Torah says, Anus Rachmana Patre. If you are forced in a situation that it's not in your hand, you are 100% not guilty. You, are, you will get reward for doing the mitzvah. Because Hashem knows you wanted to do it. But they still want to do it physically. They don't count on the discount that God gave. They want to do it. They love the mitzvot two generations ago. So, what happened? One old man come to him and say, I don't have anything to give you today. You took away all my cigarettes, my potatoes, my bread, my jacket, everything. That's it. I don't have. Look at me. Let me put fill in. Not money, not feeling. It's business here. I'm not bad Chabad here. Not feeling. Everybody say, give him, let him put feeling, let him put feeling. No. If I let him, I will have to let him, and I will have to let him. I'm not letting you put feeling. So that moment, I swear to myself, if this is what the religion is all about, I don't want to, do, to have anything to do with that. I'm not interested to be a religious Jew anymore. I threw out my yarmulke and finished. The Rabbi Silver answered him, your foolish, your foolish ears should listen to your foolish mouth. You just told me that hundreds of Jews in the worst situation you can imagine were sacrificing their life not to miss one mitzvah a day. You had nothing to learn from them. Nothing. One evil, cruel Jew, Rasha ben Blial, that took advantage on the Torah and the mitzvot, from him you decided to learn? What's wrong with you? Guess what happened? This guy started to cry in front of 300 people on Shabbat. Crying, crying, crying. Excuses, it's easy to find. Easy to find. There's one Israeli soldier, his name is Rami. I once read his life story. In one article. In Yom Kippur, they bring articles. Stories of soldiers that were in the Arab prison. Prisoners of wars. Rami was an artist. He paints 
oil paintings, nice ones. He was captured in the Egyptian prison in the Yom Kippur War 1973. The Egyptian used to torture them mentally, not only physically, mentally. One of the things they used to do is, they used to pretend that they forgot the window open. And you come out of the window and you see that the gate is also a little bit open. And then you have a place, you run into the forest or whatever, and that's it. Maybe you escape. And they used to wait. In a place when they turn, <laughs> they all laugh. <laughs> you really think we're that foolish? We'll let you escape like this? And then they used to catch them, and now they have a reason to punish them. Because you dare to escape. That's what happened to this Rami. So Ahmed, Imach Shimo Zichro, he brought him now, and he said, I have to chop off one of your hands for you daring to escape from the window. But I will be nice with you. I'm in a good mood today. Please tell me which arm you want me to chop off. The right or the left? Now this Rami is begging, no, don't do it. No, that's it. There's nothing to talk about. So he says, okay, you know, he's thinking I'm painting the beautiful pictures that I make with my right, my right hand. That's my hobby. Chop my left arm, he says. Ahmed, the most despicable monster murderer in Machshimov Zichro, told him in his face, I don't want to tell you the word he was using, but he told him, you're not embarrassed, you're a Jew, you're telling me to chop off your left arm? What about Allah that told you you must put filin on your heart every day? It's less important than your stupid pictures? You understand what happened to him? What a busha. What a busha. When the Israeli army went to assassinate Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, the head of the Hamas, he's responsible for a lot of Jewish blood in Machshimo. He was on a wheelchair. One missile went directly into his head. Many people were celebrating in Israel. They don't know that that moment 5,000 like him were born. We don't think rationally all the time. We're happy that one terrorist died. We don't know that five were born, 5,000 were born around you. Same moment. We're happy about one. <laughs> you make a dollar, you lost 5,000 at the same time. You're happy? If you're ignorant, yes. If you know what's your situation, yeah, not so happy. Anyway, everybody was happy about the assassination of this murderer. Normal. And I was amazed by one thing. When did they kill him, the helicopter? Coming out of the morning prayer out of the mosque in Gaza. What time was it? Five in the morning. He already finished to pray, Mach Shimon, a wheelchair, this murderer. This murderer goy that has no Torah, no nothing. It's like the drops of the water in a bucket or the little piece that fell into the garbage. God say, not me. He went to prayer at five in the morning. And we, do we have minyan at eight? Nine maybe, 10 maybe? <laughs> some, some of us go to David Shachrit at five. <laughs> They're, they're confused. What, what are you davening today? I'm actually confused. Maybe I'm in, in Rosh Chodesh, Arvit, Musaf. <laughs> Take it for granted. You are the prince in the palace. You want to be the shoe shine. <laughs> when I come to non-religious guys, Chilonim, what we call in Hebrew, Chiloni. Chiloni comes from the word Chol. Not Cholani, like some things. It's come from the word Chol. Kodesh and, Kodesh and Chol. That Shabbat for him, it's a week, weekday, Chol. So the Chiloni, the Chiloni, when you speak to him, you tell him, why are you not religious? Leave me alone. Enough with your brainwash. I'm not interested. I'm happy with my life. I live my life, you live your life. Sound familiar, no? I'm sure you said it a few hundred times, each one of you. That's okay, it's normal. I have nothing to say. I'm not complaining. I'm just describing a scenario here. So, 
you tell the Chiloni, what makes you think you're happy in your life? Even though later when you check, when you go to his psychologist, how many things he cries for him. I had people who swore to me that they're very happy with their life, and two days later were calling me and telling me all the problems. <laughs> Just two days ago, you say you love your life. Once he saw that the Torah is the word of Hashem, all of a sudden the truth came out, the truth. But anyway, I told him a story. In Africa, I used to be a slave called Conta Kinte. You heard about him? Some of you never heard about him, but the older one knows who I'm talking about. He used to be a show called Roots, Shorashim, in Israel, 25, 30 years ago. It shows what the white people did to the black people in Africa. A black person in Africa in the time of the slavery, they used to buy him for $20, and you know, he's a slave. For 40, 50 years, he doesn't have rights. You do whatever you want with him. God forbid, like a horse or a donkey. That's it. That's their rights. Go to work, don't sleep, don't eat, beat you up with a whip. One time, an American lawyer went to Africa on a business, and he saw white men beating up Conta Quinte. Listen good to this story. It has a lot to tell us. So what happened? The American guy he couldn't see such a thing. Come on, what's wrong with you? Beating at a human being. What are you talking about? It's Africa here. Oh, oh, oh don't touch him. As I own him. What do you mean, don't touch him? Okay, how much can I buy him from you? Twenty dollars. Here, twenty dollars. Leave him alone. Now this contact come to the white man from America and say, don't leave me here. Soon as you disappear, somebody else will grab me and I'll be his slave. There's no way to run here. That's exactly how it was. So the American guys, you know, Amatchil ba mitzvah omrim lo gmor. He started the mitzvah, he cannot leave it in the middle. So, okay, I'll take you with me to America. He bought him a ticket, on a boat, whatever, he bought him to America. What is he going to do with him? He lives in Long Island. He goes to work in Manhattan every day. What is he going to do with a slave? He doesn't know anything. So he told him, you know what, I'm going to put you in Lexington Avenue, uh, Lexington Avenue by the subway. You're going to be a shoe shine. Shoe shine. And every night on my way back from work, I'll pick you up. You sleep in my garage like this one until we see what we're going to do with you. That's how it was. So the way the Conta used to go to work, we have to learn a lot from this Conta. He used to come to Lexington Avenue. He has a boot, shoe shine, shoe shine, ma'am, sir, singing, dancing, hallelujah, you know. <laughs> very good, whistling, jumping. One day, a very prestige businessman sitting on a chair, and he said, what's going on here? I'm the billionaire, the big shot, 5,000 people working for me. I never remember myself happy like this fool once in my life. And look at him shining my shoe and singing and jumping and crying from happiness. So he told him, what's your secret? I wanted to see if he's normal or not. So he told him, you know, I used to be in Africa. I used to be a slave. Look at me. I'm free now. I can do whatever I want. I have my own sandwich. Nobody beats me up. <laughs> So he said, you're happy from being a shoe shine, you fool. Come be my driver. I'll teach you to drive my limo, tuxedo, cigars, whiskey, Mozart, whatever you want. And I'll give you $1,000 a week. How is that? You have a nice hat. So Conta <laughs> said, you're joking with me? <laughs> so he says... Okay, I'm coming with you. He left the boot. For whatever happened, happened. Who cares about the shoe shine now? He went and became a driver. Six months later, that American lawyer passed this, crossed the street in Park Avenue. What does he see? Familiar face. In a limo. Nice Rolls Royce limo. He grabbed him out of the window, beat him up. After five minutes that he relaxed, you're such an ungrateful creature. You left my boots, you didn't care, I brought you, I saved your life, I gave you a place to sleep, you didn't even say goodbye. I'm sorry, yeah, you're right. Okay, but tell me, you are happy every second of your life. I was jealous with you. When I came to you, if you need anything, you say, no, I'm very happy. I love my life. Why did you leave it? Conta answer, because I didn't know what the real good is until I became the driver. <laughs> now when I drive this limo with this cigar and this clothes and all this, you expect me to go back to be a shoe shine? You kill me, I won't do it. This is the story, the mashal. 
What's the nimshal? When you come to a chiloni, with all the respect, lawyer, doctor, doesn't matter, businessman, shoe shine, whatever you want. You tell, me, tell him you're happy, some of them are lying. They say, yeah, 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 and they're very depressed with their life. I'm saying those who really think they're happy. Let's analyze them for a second. Maybe they're right. You connect them to a lie detector, and the truth is that they're really not lying. They're not lying. They're really thinking that they're happy. Once they taste three months out of Shabbat, Torah, Gemara, marriage, children, respect, complete different world, it takes time to get used to everything. Then you tell them, go back to what you used to be. <laughs> As not, he doesn't want to hear about it. Telling you from experience of thousands of people that Hashem helped me to bring closer to Judaism in 15 years, I don't remember one case of a person that say I made a mistake or I don't like it or I wish I would go back to my days. Not only that, I know somebody that he had one picture left from his wedding. He didn't want his children to see how he looked in the day of his wedding with his wife and the show and the, you know, they think they're in a movie, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> he went to the mechanic, he got all the grease, you know, to put on his hair. Oh, Hashem, three days he didn't need that the suit will look nice. His belly will go down another inch maybe. 15 days she's looking for the gown that there's no material in it. I don't know what she needs a gown for. <laughs> Whatever. The rabbi comes with one eye open. Why are he closed? The shatchan is standing over there. You know, one shatchan made a shiduch for the husband and wife. So he says, listen, I have the best shiduch for you. Her father is a multi-millionaire. But there's only one problem. She doesn't see with one eye. She's a little cross-eyed. <laughs> so the guy said, what are you bringing me? No, I want a beautiful girl. No, 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 wait a minute. My friend, millions of dollars. You're going to be a very lucky man. Okay, you know what? What's the problem? No problem. Okay. Then he's calling him the next day. One more problem. You know, she's crippled a little bit. You know, no, no problem. Make sure she doesn't walk too much in front of people. You know? <laughs> He said, come on, what is this? He said, no, no, but listen, millions of dollars. You can see it, learn to write. Don't have to worry about Parnassa. Every hour he gets something. Yes. Finally, they come to the wedding. <laughs> the guy comes and see. He said, wow. She's a hunchback, you know? <laughs> she knows like this, like nine years old. He comes to the Shatchan, standing right next to him. You didn't tell me this. So that's okay, you can raise your voice, she also doesn't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is, the Torah says, Ta'amu ruki tov Hashem. You want to see that I'm real good, that my Torah is real good? I, I made you. I created you, I created your body, I created your soul. And I gave you the Torah, that's the food, the antibiotic to your soul. I know, I'm the, I'm the manufacturer. You know better than me what's good for you? I told you Shabbat is the perfect good for you, for your children, for your family, for your soul, for everything. You think to go to the business to work is better? You're fooling yourself. All the money you're going to make on Shabbat, guarantee you will never enjoy. If you enjoy it, it's only temporary. Later you pay with agony and pay for every penny. Nobody can rebel against me and win. I'm not a Palestinian terrorist that you can blow your, his head off and say, oh, we're winning the war against terror. No, you're not fighting against me. I'm supplying you with oxygen, with water, with your wife, with your children, with your car, with your house, with your work, with your, everything you have. Every step you make is thanks to me. I save you for so much problems. Hundreds of times you're supposed to be in jail. Problems, surgery, who knows how many things I do for you. And what do you do? Only complain, don't listen, don't keep, nothing. And then when God forbid the tragedy happened, guess what? He has the nerve to come and scream. Where was God when this and this happened? You want to know where was he? Open the Torah and read. 
Just imagine, imagine that I put in my backyard a fence with 12 different signs. 12 different signs. What are the signs about? Warning, explosive material under the ground. Minefield. But I put a fence with signs, warning, 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 do not enter, life risk, warning. One of the guys was a wise guy. He jumped inside, he walked, boom, explosion, he lost his leg. Now he wants to sue me in court. How many minutes it's going to take the judge to kick him and throw him out of the stairs? How many minutes it's going to take? Do you think he will find a lawyer to represent his case? No, no. Warning all over. You enter a place you are not allowed to enter. Twelve times the Torah says, more than anything else, I made the seventh day in a creation holy as a covenant as eternal covenants between me and the nation of Israel for eternity. You want to be my son. You want to be my faithful son, my loyal son. You want to show that you're with me? What's the foundation of everything? The Sabbath. V'shamru b'nei Israel et ha-Shabbat. The nation of Israel observed the Sabbath. לעשות את השבת לדורותם ברית עולם, to make Shabbat for eternity and eternal covenant, eternal, not temporary, between me, ביני ובין בני ישראל, between me and the nation of Israel, אות אי לעולם, it's a sign forever that I made the world in six days, and in the seventh day I rested. What comes right after? And I told you, I warn you in the beginning that you may not like to hear it, but the truth must be said, must be. It's no choice. What comes right after that? Mechaleleha mot yumat. Someone who will dare to make the Sabbath a weekday and to work and to create father and all the other things that some of us do not only deserve to be executed, God forbid, what comes after that is a billion times worse. People don't pay attention. V'nichreta ha-nefesh ha-i mi-Israel. I, or in another place it says, V'nichreta ha-nefesh ha-i mi-Amea. I am going to cut. God forbid, I'm getting goosebumps all over my body after I said 5,000 times already. It never stopped because it's shocking. People are ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. Ignorance, not knowing the rule, doesn't change reality. What comes right after that? I am going to cut that soul of this Mechalel Shabbat out of my nation for eternity. He has no part of the world to come. Billions of years of lost for shopping five minutes a day on Shabbat or watching a stupid baseball game or cooking a soup. When today you can do everything without violating Shabbat. Soup you can cook from before. You put it on the fire. Psh, you eat hot soup. We eat hot soup. Chulen, cold, cold cut, rice, hot bread, salad. We eat five stars restaurant. No limitation whatsoever today with today's technology. Lights on and off as much as we want. Taking, go to the park, going with the children, playing in the backyard, sleeping, eating, learning, enjoying, bringing guests, singing, and in earning eternity. And the other hand, what's the other option? Losing everything. Why? The foundation of, of the covenant. The people don't understand what does it mean, covenant. Covenant means an eternal agreement. You make an agreement between you and your wife. What did you promise her in Ektuba? That you won't marry another woman besides her. You give her money, relation. You care for her. You give her clothes to wear. You be nice to her. One guy 
wanted to teach his wife how to be a loyal wife. They got married, angry guy, you know. <sighs> so, on the night of the wedding, they get home, very happy, they have the bag with all the checks. <laughs> Before they get into counting the money, <laughs> the first thing he does, he take a chair and smash it on her head. Boom! The chair go, falls to hundreds of pieces on the floor. She's bleeding. She's all over the floor. Oh, wow! What did you do? Call 911. <laughs> what did I do? One minute I'm with you. What did I do? You didn't do anything. He's lighting a cigarette. You didn't do anything. So what's the problem? This is when you didn't do anything. Just imagine if you dare to do something, what's going to happen to you? <laughs> she was 100% loyal. <laughs> so, I started to speak about the renewal of the moon. Time is running out. We have to finish soon. I know it's long lecture, but you know, it's not a local everyday lecture. Once, once or twice it happens a year or three times a year, I must take advantage on as much as I can. I once had a lecture from 8 in the evening until 7.30 in the morning straight. <laughs> straight. Well, maybe it's a world record. And the best part, <laughs> and the best part was that half of the people there in Brooklyn were sitting on the floor because there was not enough chair in that house. And all of them stayed to the morning. When I went out, if you know Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn, on the way to Manhattan at 7.30 in the morning, you know what's happening over there? You see the sunrise? Bumper to bumper, two hours just to get to Manhattan. I have to go from Manhattan to Muncie. Light outside. All the people in that apartment became religious that night. One of them became so religious until he used to be a drug dealer. Interesting story to tell your children on the Shabbos table. <laughs> so this guy is coming to me on Yom Kippur. I say to him, in Yom Kippur, you know, it's a very holy prayer in the night. We come home 11, 11.30 at night. We sit in a deck, relaxing from the long night. Then he tells me a story. So, you know, I was working for an Israeli guy in Brooklyn, taking suitcases of drugs, $20,000 a day. Once in a while, he calls me up, I meet him, he gives me a suitcase, I take it to LA, to New York, you know, that's how it was. Drive a Lexus, a car, money, live like a king. Young guy, 20 something years old. <sighs> then he says, one time I went to LA, I was about to come with a plane. I mean, this is in the days before the security was so tight, before we had to take shoes off. So, <laughs> so the guy is planned to go on a plane. And he got a phone call, don't take the plane. Just come with buses. Buses, change buses. It takes a week to get from you know, LA from here, you know, to here. So go on the buses. Just when he got, I think, to Pennsylvania area, he has four or five more hours to get to New York, they have a police checkout. The police, two cops, FBI agents, they have their ID hanging on their, ne on their chain. One goes from the first front door, one goes from the middle door with flashlight. It was the evening. He is the last person in a bus on the left. He has a small suitcase like the black that I have, some, some full of 50,000 ecstasy pills. In some countries, it's dead sentence right away, such, such a thing. In America, it's 10 to 20 years, depend who is your judge, if his wife beat him up before he left the house or not. It all depends on his mood. So anyway, the guy is telling me the story. He said, listen to this. How I started to come to the lectures, he said. Because they came from one person to the other on the bus, like this. That's it, I'm the last one on the All of a sudden, he looks at this. He said, what do you have there in a the bag? <laughs> the guy he said, my stuff. So open it up. They're not looking for him. They're looking for somebody else. They have a picture of somebody criminal that escaped. I don't know what. But they check the buses there. So open it up. Now you know how those suitcases. You have to go around. And then you open. How long does it take? So, my 
I didn't feel my hands trying to br pick up the suitcase, and I'm doing it slow. I pretend I was fall, you know, asleep. I'm picking it up, putting it on a chair. I'm beginning to open the zipper, he says. That's it. Go, go, go. Up. That's it. Now, that's it. I have to open. The guy got on the bus and said, it's okay, we got him. He said, you okay. One half a second for that penalty. Finished. So you okay. It's not you. Okay, they left. Okay, so the guy became religious, no problem. Then one day I see he comes to the lecture with an Israeli model, tight jeans, you know, with a show, like this. <laughs> I want to look nice for myself. I'm not doing it for the guys in the street. Let's see her in the island with the monkeys if she's going to put her makeup or not. <laughs> one guy told me, Rabbi, what's the problem? My wife wants to get a tan with a bikini. What's the problem? I said, well, what do you mean, what's the problem? You want 5,000 guys to look at your wife's body? You crazy? Not normal. What do you mean? Everyone does it. In a beach, it's normal. So I asked him, tell me, imagine your wife make you a birthday party, and as a surprise, she comes out in front of 300 guests in your living room with her bikini. <laughs> Would she still be your wife a minute later? You kidding? Oh, you know, well... It's not the guy who broke the chair on her. It's a different guy. <laughs> a guy, that she got the chair in her head, she wear a sack. <laughs> so now, <laughs> so I said, so tell me please, what's the difference? If your wife come in front of 300 guests or 30 guests in your living room, you're willing to jump, divorce, I had it. But in front of millions guidos on the beach, <laughs> like this, walk with their cut t-shirt, oil all over their body, like this. In front of, of those psychos, you don't care that they look at her and think whatever they think. You know why? Because you are not normal. <laughs> so, you know, you got me on this. That's the truth. People don't think. They don't think. When people begin to think, they see that their life is corrupted from A to Z. As long as you live, you can correct, the Torah says. Once you die, you die, my friend. So this guy comes with a model. She walk in. I say, now I have a mission. I got to make her religious. Okay, so slowly, slowly, she, he says that she's keeping Shabbat. Then he said, we're going to Israel to get married. I say, something smells fishy here. I told him, you know, it's too, you just know her two months, it's too, too fast. No, no, she's great, she's into religion now, she bought me books, you know, stories. He goes to Israel, the date of the wedding, let's say, is next week, a week passed by, I hear from someone that his marriage got cancelled. What happened? You know, things like this happen in our days. He found her, you know where, with his best friend, a week before the wedding. So he canceled the wedding. Now he wants to come back to New York. He left her alone. But he found out that all his gang was caught by the FBI. 30 Israelis in Brooklyn in one hour. Helicopters, FBI agent, all over them. They got the okay. Boom, boom, boom. 35 police, FBI, everybody's in jail. But he's in Israel. They don't, they don't know where he is. Talking more than 10 years ago, this story. So now he got a phone call from his friend, don't dare to come to America. All your friends are in jail and for sure they gave your name away. Probably on the list. He hired a lawyer, I don't know what he did to check if he's wanted or not. The lawyer told him, I don't see any record that you wanted. The guy arrived to Kennedy Airport, less than a second, four guys coming around him, FBI, you're under arrest, federal prison. Six and a half years. Six and a half years, the guy went in. We told him, don't come back. In the meantime, after what happened to him with the girl, he left Shabbat and everything. The minute he left the Torah, he arrived to New York. In one week, his life was over. Then when they took him out of jail, they sent him to Ben Gurion Airport with a brown uniform, with two agents throwing him in the airport with pyjama, with nothing. That's how it was. And then I went a year ago to Israel. Guess where I found him? In the best pizza shop in the world, in Afula. If you ever go to Israel, you go to Afula, you see. 
My uncle owned it. But not because he owned it, it's the best pizza. It's the best pizza in the world. Over there, I see the guy. What happened? What's life? I don't have a money, a penny, nothing, no job, I'm here, nothing. If Hashem wants, you go all the way up. If He wants, God forbid, He buries you alive. Don't think there is coincidence. Now you may come and ask, how come wicked people celebrate? They don't get punished right away. They murder, they rape, they steal, they drive nice cars, fancy cars. I don't see justice, Rabbi. What justice you are talking about? The rabbis, they beg for $200 to live. And my friend, all his businesses are booming on Shabbat. Yom Kippur, he paid double to the Israelis to come to work. He buys real estate. He drives a Ferrari. You're telling me there is justice? How many religious people have cancer? Everybody has it. There's no God here. Don't tell us stories. We hear it all the time. It's a very, very strong argument in one condition that the Torah didn't speak about it. But once the Torah spoke about it, what did the Torah say about it? No, you tell me. What did the Torah say about people who are wicked and they are celebrating from morning to night? Vacation, Acapulco, Honolulu, <laughs> Casino. Las Vegas, I'm a top model, Rabbi. I'm a, I'm a soccer player. My whole business is on Shabbat. Here is what the Torah says. It's not me. It's right here in front of you. That's what the, the Torah says. You should know. Here, right here in front of you in pink. Your God, He is the master. The faithful God who keep His covenant and the kindness to his lovers, who is considered his lover. Are we in this category? Let's see. To his lovers, who keep his mitzvot. Not religious in their heart. That's gurnish. That's nothing. Rabbi, I love God. Do you know how many times I kiss the mezuzah every day? <laughs> My grandfather in Yemen was a rabbi, the mori. Your grandfather is in heaven, and let's hope you get there also. <laughs> Your grandfather was a Mori in Yaman. Grandfather was a holy man that walked against his evil inclination. What are you doing? Live like a goy. You expect to be with your father together? That means God is a liar. If you want to be where your grandfather is, that means you say that the Torah is a lie because God says in the Torah, in the end, I pay everyone exactly what they deserve. Why doesn't it happen right away? Because it will eliminate the free choice completely. If every murderer will get a bullet into his head a minute after he kills someone. If every Michal and Shabbos that light a cigarette or turn the television on, it explodes in his face. Who would dare to violate Shabbat a minute later? All the Jews in Shabbat will be like this. <laughs> Moshe, what's going on? Shabbat started. Shh. <laughs> what's the purpose of the life? The Torah says the Torah is, the life is a test. Where does it say in the Torah that life is a test? Right in front of you, right here. I don't have my laser with me, but here is right here. Read with me. I'm torturing you. Torture. Problems. Business is not what it used to be, Rabbi. Problems with the wife. Problems with the children. I can't find my soulmate. I'm sick. This, that. Ah, we have plenty of problems, each one of us. No one is clean, trust me. No one in the world is clean. You don't see the basket of your friend. If you see his basket, you love your basket. That's usually how it is. But it's right in front of us. The Torah says, I am torturing you to test you. What was that? A test. Here is another one. It's a test. What's the test for? When you give somebody a test, there is a purpose for the test. What's the purpose? Let's see. Maybe you want to make him a doctor, so he has to pass the test. Yeah? So... To see what's in your heart. Are you going to keep my mitzvot or not? 
What is the most important thing for God in this life? And that's the only reason why he put us here. To obey his rules in the Torah, nothing else. He doesn't care what kind of car you drive and how nice is your house. It's all temporary. Torah say life is a blink of the eye. Ke'eref ayin in Hebrew. What does it mean, ke'eref ayin? The eye, every five seconds you blink. Five, six, seven. Depends how much money you lost today. <laughs> Some people, they, their eyes are closed constantly. <laughs> you had a good day, maybe five times in a minute you blink. What do you need to blink? You clean, it's windshield wiper, so you have to clean your eyes from the dust. But the main reason, because the muscle needs to rest that tenth of a second. Every few seconds, the muscle needs one half of a second rest to make it keep going for 80, 90 years. So the Torah says when you will look back in your life, it would look like a blink of the eye. Keheref ein, before you realize it's over. And what's the bottom line? Yefashfesh b'maasav. Check who you are, what you did. You corrected your pride. You are still stingy. You are still angry. You are still like a... Go to a wedding, see what happened in a, in a wedding. You want to clear the dancing floor? Just bring the ice cream to the side. What's the name of the ice cream? <laughs> deep and Dots. Deep and Dots. You know, it's hard for Israeli to say Deep and Dots. You have an Israeli version? All right, we'll think about something. Anyway, you bring Deep and Dots to the corner of the place. In one minute, the wedding is over. <sighs> All the lions and the tigers are pushing. <laughs> See what happened in hotels in a breakfast. For the plates. You know, they put the plates always in one corner. In the seminars. Wow, come from here, try from the left, attack from the left, helicopter on the right, try to get a plate. <laughs> What's going on? God forbid I miss a piece of watermelon. How can I live without it? The Torah says that the purpose of life is to, cor to correct your negative. You died stingy, you were reborn in another life. I have a whole life about it, a whole lecture about it, life after life, very good lecture. <coughs> because the reality is fascinating. When you see today the scientific world proved that people have reincarnation. They remember previous lives in hypnotizing people, it's unbelievable. But when you see something very interesting, when you take three different children, you give them pretzels to each one of them. First one will give you one, you want another one, he's gonna fall on the floor, cry for an hour. I gave you these pretzels, you fool, you don't wanna give me two? He doesn't understand. The second one, even one he doesn't wanna give you. You come to the third one, he gives you the whole bag. How did the children, two years old, knows about being stingy? Who told them about it? The kids should have thought that they can get unlimited amount of pretzel. Take this, I'll get another five. That's the problem. Anyway, when I fall in a supermarket on the floor, my brother, my mother bring me the whole shelf. <laughs> All I have to do is fall on the floor. <laughs> so, the answer is, the first boy died when he was seven years old, one, two, five years ago. He died stingy. He was willing to give a dollar, two dollars here and there, tzedakah. More than that, it's too much. Rabbi, you want too much. You have big eyes. Come on. That's the first kid with a pretzel. He died stingy. He's born stingy again in a new body. Same soul, different box. Second one, God forbid. He doesn't eat. He doesn't go to the bathroom because he's afraid to eat again. That's how stingy he is. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but it's sad also. It just depends what you want to do. You want to cry, you want to laugh. <laughs> Sometimes the reality is so frustrating that we begin to laugh, you know, yeah, that's it. Kasher avadnu, avadnu. The third one was very generous. What do you want? You want food? Take as much as you want. You want my car? Have it. Bring it whenever you want. You, oh, here is, I have a brand new suit, I don't like it, take it. I don't want money, take it. Take money. You need anything, come again. Why is like this? Since he's a kid, he's like this. Because he died generous. 
He doesn't have a test about it anymore. He has already corrected that trait, that midah, in his previous life. He has to correct what he still did not correct. Anger, jealousy, being faithful, being grateful. There's a lot of things we have to correct. Comes the Torah and teaches us how to do it. And the Torah says, I'm testing you to see what's in your heart. Are you going to have faith? You're going to keep my mitzvot? Disciplined? Or you're going to live like an animal? And here he comes, the next sentence, right here. I want to teach you a lesson in life. You eat bread. Today it's Chinese, pizza, bread. Who eats bread today? But in the old days they used to eat bread. So the Torah says, Don't think that the food that you eat, that's what gives you the energy to move. Yes, reality, yes. Food you need, it's gasoline for the body. No. Ki al kol moza pi Hashem ichyeh adam. There's another half to the picture. What came out of my mouth in Mount Sinai is this Torah. This is the real life. And you should know inside your heart. Right here. V'yadata ayom. Pasuk hei. Ka'asher yeyaser ish et bno. The same way a father is strict with his son. Hashem Elokecha Meyasreka, I am very strict with you. Why? Because I love you. That's why I took away your money. If I'll give you as much as you want, you die, you won't earn the ticket to the life of eternity. What's better? To be rich 15 years here and have nothing there? Or to pass the test with all the strictness and earn life of eternity? The Torah says, listen to this. Shocking. Shocking how, how ignorant we could be. Shocking. Unbelievable. The Torah says, if you take, this is what it says, Yafa sha'a shel korat ruach ba'olam haba mikol chaye ha'olam haze. One hour of pleasure in the next life will be equal to more than all this life in this earth. What does it mean? Take all the people who lived here from the time of the creation until today, thousands of years. Multiply by millions and billions of people that lived here and still alive here. Take and gather together all the pleasures they ever had. They went to the Beatles concert in 1965. There was a two hours. There was a two hours of pleasure. He went to see Pink Floyd in Yankee Stadium. Two more hours of pleasure. He has the best models in the world. He has the best factory. He has two pizza stores. He has factory. He has the, uh, the best ice cream in America. A nice car. Whatever. Whatever you can think of. Multiply all of it together, times 70 years of a life of all the people together will not be equal to one hour of the reward of one religious Jew in the next life. And what are we going to lose it for? For our stupidity. Rabbi, kasher, kasher, kosher, don't be too fanatic. <laughs> the Chilonim has a beautiful sentence. I wish it was in the Torah belongs there. What does it say? Tzochek mi she tzochek acharon. In boxing, two guys are beating up one another. One guy's on the floor, then he gets up. Then he goes on the floor, he gets up. In the end, he gave one to the other guy, he sent them to Honolulu. <laughs> Who wins the money in the end, 30 million dollars? The one <laughs> who was smiling in the end. But in boxing, it's something very interesting. Mentioning boxing, it's very interesting. The Torah says that in the next life, the main punishment of the person is the shame. The embarrassment. That's before talking about hell and all the other punishments, God forbid. Before even getting into it. I have a whole lecture about it. But I'm not putting it on a website. Because <laughs> it's going to be too depressing. If you ever feel that you're brave enough, 
be in touch with me on the website, on the, on the email, and I'll give you the link where you can find it. Until then, since not that many people can tolerate the truth, unfortunately, the Torah said that the main punishment is what? Is the shame. The Torah says that the shame, the embarrassment, is much more painful than physical pain. For instance, go over to see boxing. Two guys beating up one another. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, no. 45 minutes, one kills the other. In the end, one of them will fall down, knock out. The guy is counting. One, two, ten. Everybody screams. Wow. The guy is on the floor. What? The loser will always do in a, max, in a boxing match. Always, but I mean always. He grabs the ropes around the ring, goes like this, and goes like this to the crowd. And everybody claps. Wow, our hero is back on his feet. I'm still standing, right? <laughs> Why? Why it's so important for him that 10 seconds of waving to the crowd? He doesn't see in his eyes anyway. <laughs> his heart, his brain, everything is broken to pieces. Ten minutes later, he's going to die in an ambulance. It happens all the time. <laughs> I once saw Muhammad Ali in Broadway. One night, I was many years ago, and we were standing in the same light. I said, Muhammad! He was waving to the other side. I'm swearing to you, I'm not lying to you. He was waving to the other side. I didn't know where it comes from. I said, here, here! cannot see what's going on from all the millions of dollars in a bank. But he doesn't know where he is. <laughs> so, he is willing to risk his life, to get up, to make a situation physically a million times worse. It could be that's it. You destroyed yourself, you can become paralyzed for moving. Not allowed to move after an accident. Just to avoid five seconds of embarrassment. Once I came, I asked a guy in yeshiva, I see today you dress nice. What's the occasion? <laughs> the guy said, I'm going out on a date. I say, where? In Brooklyn. Ah, it's far. <coughs> How do you have money? The rabbi gave me a hundred dollars. It's not a rich, a rich yeshiva. You know, a hundred dollars is a lot of money to give every guy to go on a date. So I told him, hey, very interesting. He said, tell me, what did you feel when the rabbi gave you the $100? He said, I wanted to die as a bushot, what an embarrassment. I had to go to the rabbi, tell him I'm going on a date, I don't have a dollar in my pocket, I got to take a bus. So I told him, what happens if I bring a machine to the yeshiva? <laughs> the machine grabs your head like this, it goes inside, that's it, there's no way out. Then there's a box, you know, a glove that comes, boom, give you a punch in your forehead. You fall for a second on the floor, and a hundred dollars is falling. <laughs> what would you do next date? Would you go to the rabbi, or you go to my machine? So a hundred percent go to your machine. Why? When people had physical pain, they tolerated, they somehow overcome. When they put on a newspaper that they caught them stealing or do whatever they did, they jump from the window. They cannot tolerate the pain, the embarrassment. The Torah says the world to come, it's all shame, embarrassment, busha that is endless. There's no way to hide. You cannot hide under the table. One time I drove home, 2 o'clock at night, I hear a tape. This tape made a big impact on my life. So you have to be lucky sometimes. This rabbi that made that tape is already in Gan Eden probably five, six years by now. He's not here anymore. He was a great speaker, so he said like this. Say so sometimes a person wants to make a scene. He's about to make a scene, a guy is running by. How are you doing? He cannot make the scene, he pause. The next day he comes to make the scene, a little three years old boy comes and look at him. Go to mommy, go to mommy, he doesn't want to move. The boy, take a candy, no. He said to the girl, okay, let's come back tomorrow. The next day he comes back, he see a black, angry dog looks at him like this, angry like this. He said, go, go. The dog doesn't want to move. So he said to the wife, to the, to the woman, eh, you know what, I'm sorry, look at this dog. He's annoying. He's inside the room here. I'm trying to push him out. He doesn't want to move. He looks at me like this. I don't feel comfortable. We'll come back next week. 
after 120 years, if he make half of it through, he comes in front of Hashem, the trial is one year. That's why we say Kaddish on the deceased people for one year. It's a reason for it. One year Kaddish to make his trial easier. For our fathers, for our brothers, whatever. He comes in front of Hashem, the Goim that died and came back to life, clinical died, watch my lecture, life after life. The Goim saw all their life from the moment they're born until that moment of the accident. Snaps, picture, chronological order, one after the other, millions of pictures. In the five, ten minutes that they were dead, no pulse, no brain waves, no breath, no nothing, no feelings. You pinch them, they don't feel anything. Ten minutes. They came back to life, the, the soul was flying all over the hospital, you know, watch the lecture, you understand what I'm talking about. They went into the tunnel, all of them with no exception, Jews and non-Jews, saw their entire life as they were crawling on the carpet as babies until this moment. One guy said, the guy, it's needless to say a Jew that he has a much bigger mission here. The guy said, they showed me that all my life was wrong. I felt horrible. I felt I wish I can go back and start all over again. I saw the goy that I did not achieve anything in my life. I did not complete one thing perfectly in my life. I felt horrible with embarrassment. After 120 years, we come in front of Hashem. Hashem said to us, tell me, my friend, my son, my Jewish son, my ungrateful Jewish son, I am worse than a dog in your eyes. In front of the dog, you couldn't make the scene. The dog was staring at you. You felt horrible. When I watched you 70 years, every second of your life, not once you were embarrassment to do what you do, eating pork, eating without bracha, stealing in a business, cheating, smoking on Shabbat, doing all the things you do, multiply by seven years, not once you felt a knife Going into your heart, that means I'm worse than a dog. I fed you for 70 years, and I'm a dog in your eyes. Just imagine the busha, the embarrassment. Where a person is going to hide? Where? It's too late. The Torah's ignorance, it all comes down to one cause. Ignorance is the most dangerous thing to the life of a person. There's an eye who watch over you. Ein roa ve'ozen shomad ve'chol ma'asecha ba'sefer nichtavim. There's an eye who watch over you. There's an ear who listens to you. And everything you do is been registered in the book of God. You cannot delete. It's not emails. Delete history. Over there the history is strong in front of your eyes. How you delete history? Here it is in front of you. I'll show you this and we'll finish. Unless if you want to continue. But if not, we'll finish with this. Here I'm I show you what I'm talking about. Here, look at this. Shh. No? Where are you? Okay, here. From the top to the bottom. Anefesh achotet hitamut. The soul that make the sins in front of me will pay the price. A son will not be punished for the sins of his father. And a father will not be punished for the sins of the sons if he raised him in the right way. If that's his fault, Whatever another Jew does because of you, it's your responsibility, even when he's not your son. It's needless to say your son, yeah? When it's your responsibility, responsibility to raise him in a Torah way, in a Jewish way. Then you wonder why he brought Christine. Rabbi, I'll give you a Mercedes if you send my, my, my son wants to marry her. I'll give you everything you want. Where were you 18 years? Send him to public school now, you wonder why he brought Christine? <laughs> Well, what is going on here? What did you expect? He grew up with her. They ate from the same dining room. He doesn't know religion. We are people. They are people. He doesn't know God say you must be separate from them. 
Not, don't get me wrong. Not because they're less than us. Some of them are fantastic human beings, and I know hundreds of them. Hundreds. Fantastic people. Behemet. A hundred percent. I'm a witness. Good heart. Generosity. Tolerance. Beautiful manners. It's not up to me. What do you want? I cannot marry you. I love you. You gr you're gorgeous. You're everything. God told me you're not allowed. What do you have? Same thing, I love pork. Shrimps, whatever it is. Everyone has different desires. I can't. I have to obey my father's rules. But Rabbi, she's much better than my ex-girlfriend. I know. <laughs> but your ex-girlfriend is legal and she's not legal. Why? Because your creator say that he's the manufacturer. <laughs> Only Mercedes can say that Mercedes 500 is better than Mercedes 320. <laughs> it's not for me and you to decide. We didn't make the car. <laughs> so the Torah says, a father is not going to be punished for the sins of his sons. Tzidkat tzadik alav, if you're righteous, you get the reward. The wicked person is responsible for his wickedness. Now listen to this. Let's finish with a good hope. Rasha in Hebrew means not like some Israeli things, Rasha it's evil. No. Rasha means wicked. What's the difference between wicked and evil? Evil, it's cruel. Oregon, yes, terrible temper, whatever. Wicked, maybe I'm not saying the right words in English, but get the point. Rasha in Hebrew means violating the rules of the Torah purposely. Could be a very nice person, generous, good manners, everybody likes him, he's a great joker, comedian, handsome, whatever you want. He learned Shakespeare 500 times. He's a judge in Israeli court in Tel Aviv. Tomorrow is going to be the prime minister. Well, who cares? The king of whatever. He's Rasha. Why? He shaved with a razor. The Torah says you're not allowed to have razor touch your face in five different places. Cover the soul. The soul is in the head. You don't understand why? Learn. You don't learn? That's okay. You be ignorant. At least you obey the rules. Oh, wow. I guess they want you to see this video about the war. All of a sudden it starts, banging on the... Uh, anyway, Rasha means not, not following the rules of the Torah, even though he may have a wonderful, uh, a wonderful heart. So the Torah says, ki yashuv mikol chatotav. He will repent from all his sins, not what easy. Rabbi, okay, slowly, slowly. Today I'll start... Instead of eating, uh, you know, non-kosher out of the house, so out of the, uh, in the house I'll be kosher. Out of the house I eat everything, but inside the house I don't bring non-kosher food. Okay, for how long? 50 years. It's like this. <laughs> no, like this one week, two weeks. Gonna move on to the next step. Life is short. You came here to earn. You didn't come to wait to sleep here. You didn't come here to sleep and to eat. If God wanted you to come and eat and enjoy this physical world, he'll make you a chimpanzee. What does he need you to be Yitzchak or Moshe with intelligence? You want to enjoy relation? You be a chimpanzee. You want to enjoy the, the tasty, the, the, the delicious food? You be a chimpanzee. You don't have to work 30 years to pay the mortgage. Not four hours a day traffic. World crisis. The pig flu. Vaccines. Doctors. College. Eight years in college. $200,000 in the end. He's unemployed for three years, like most of the college graduate. Why I went to college? 90% of the people go to college because their parents forced them to. Why their parents wanted them to go to college? Not to embarrass them in front of all their loser friends. Why? Because his son is a doctor, you're going to be a doctor. If not, you're not going to get a penny for my will. That's what it is. I hear I'm talking to all these young guys. Watch, Rabbi, help me. How do I convince my father that I don't want to waste time? Five, six years, pay $200,000 tuition, that in the end I'm going to make 60,000 years. Can go make it tomorrow. 
Tomorrow I can make it. Buy, buy, sell, merchandise here, there, cars, whatever. Can make the same thing. Cars, cars. Taxi driver makes more today than college graduate. How many years they have to pay their student loans? That's the system, Rabbi. Without a college degree, you are nothing in this country. Why? Because God doesn't exist for them. I am my own God. The college is going to bring me fame and glory and money. Yeah, like David Amelech went to college, or Shlomo Amelech went to college, or Rambam went to college. The greatest brains in the history didn't know what college is. Some of them were billionaires. Even today, I met a guy in Brooklyn, 20 sneaker stores. He doesn't know how to sign his name in English. Never went to school in his life. I know one guy used to take shower with a horse in the backyard. College? Who had money for college? Today, he owns the Plaza Hotel in, in, in New York. He's worth about $4 billion. Nice guy. Whatever. Doesn't matter. I'm just giving you examples. Anyway, we'll go back to the point here. The wicked person will make repentance from all his sins that he made and keep all my laws and made judgment to himself. What do I do right? What do I do wrong? Who do I owe money? Who did I steal money that I have to return? How many Shabbos I didn't keep in my life? How do I clean it for my record? How do I give charity that I owe for all the years that I made millions and I didn't give the 10% that I'm obligated by law to give to Jewish institutions, kosher ones, not phony ones. Most people will give phony institutions. They don't know what it means. They give. They give a synagogue that marry men to men. How about I gave $100 million to this synagogue? Yeah, thank you for helping them to marry men to men and whatever they do over there. The priest and the rabbi play backhammon on Shabbat. <laughs> One rabbi went on the way to shul in, in Baghdad 100 years ago. He hear the Iraqi Jews play backhammon on Shabbat for money, gambling. It's a real story. The rabbi said, what? Jews in Baghdad? This is 100 years ago. Everybody had yamaka, remember, and beard. But the, bar, the problem is a beard is for free and a yamaka is for a dollar. It doesn't make you a great human being, the outside look. So the rabbi went in the back of the house. He broke into the backyard. What? Shabbat? Instead of coming to pray, to, say, to sing for Hashem, you're playing on money on Shabbat? Rabbi, forgive us, I'm sorry. Some people, the rabbi is more important than God for them. The rabbi saw me, I cannot sleep at night. Well, what happened about Hashem? He sees you for 70 years. <laughs> Hashem? They say Hashem has mercy, no? <laughs> I'll manage with him, don't worry. Look, I have blue eyes. Fool, who gave you the blue eyes? <laughs> You're going to bribe Hashem with your eyes or your nice hair? With your belly full of sushi? What are you going to offer him? <laughs> So anyway, the rabbi went in. Money on Shabbat, backgammon, what's going on? The rabbi, they kiss his hand. Faradim has big emunat chachamim, you know. They collected all the money in a bag. Rabbi, you come tonight, Motzei Shabbat, the whole money is for you for the synagogue. The rabbi comes, Motzei Shabbat, nice chunk. Beautiful. Good business to be a rabbi. <laughs> Very good. What happened? Then they come to synagogue every morning, tefillin, they pray. Three months later, the rabbi passed by again. Again they're playing. He went in. Rabbi, what? Oh, again, backgammon on Shabbat? Oh, Baba. Well, guess what happened this time? One guy gave him such a smack in his face. The other guy pulled his beard. They kick him. He runs on the street in Baghdad, and everybody throwing him things. <laughs> So then a few days later, he couldn't believe what's going on. Three months ago, they kissed my hand, they kissed my feet, they gave me the money. Now they're beating me up. What? What happened? He went to the Ben Ishchai. Rabbi Yosef Chaim was the head chief rabbi of Baghdad, of Iraq. The Ben Ishchai told him something, and it's all about us. You can learn from it. First time, it really bothered you that Jews rebelling against God. Shabbat, you go to the synagogue, you didn't know you're going to get money. You did it for the truth. 
When a person does something for the truth, Hashem is always behind him. He helps him because he's interested that he will be successful. Second time you didn't care about Hashem and about the Shabbat. You cared about your stomach. You knew there's a hundred bucks waiting for me over there. Ah, as a nice mitzvah. When you went in, Hashem already didn't help you. This is how it looks without Hashem's help. You saw? <laughs> that you got what you deserve. This is what happened to us today. Some people religious, just for the record. Some are really, it really bothers them that so many millions of Jews live in a darkness. I have people here in Toronto, they help. They send money, even though in Canada it's harder because American money, it's more expensive. They send, they're not rich, send 100, 200, whatever they send, 300. What do they care about? Why they send money? To make these DVDs right there for free. Each one costs a dollar to make. That's all with the printing, with the... They send. They could have bought another suit with this money. They can go twice again to the restaurant every month. They can do other things. They can take another vacation every six months with this. Why they send money? Because it bothers them there are so many other Jews that don't know anything about life. They live for no reason. Grinding water. Every second of the, of the life of so many Jews, they waste their whole life, eternity. And I know the truth, and my neighbor's going to start his car on Shabbat, go to the beach, I'm going to the synagogue, and I close my eyes for my brother, he's going for eternity of suffering after he's going to die, because he went against his creator, and I could have saved him. One rich guy had ten sons. Ten. Nine are poor, and one is a millionaire. The millionaire sponsored all of his expenses. Before the old man died, he gathered all his sons and told them, I love each one of you. Thank you for being great children. You, the rich one, I want to talk to you separately after them. When they all left the room, the father told the wealthy son, you don't love me. You hate me. You, if you would love me, you would behave different. So the rich guy said, Abba, you got it mixed. 20 years I pay your mortgage. I rent your car, I pay your electric, I gave you food every week. I took you around, you, live, you slept in my house. What do you mean I don't love you? I'm the only one who helped you out. They didn't give you anything. True, no? He has a good point. The father said, no, no, no. Everything you say, it's 100% true. There's only one problem. You have nine other brothers are starving for bread, for food. Don't have money to eat. You help me, because you, between me and you, everything is fine. But if you would really love me, you would help your brothers to have what to eat. Because you see that I see my other nine sons are suffering every day. It burns my heart. If you really love me, in one second, you could have prevent all this suffering that I had in the last 30 years. You give this guy 50,000, this guy 100,000, you open a business for this guy, have millions. You could have helped your brothers. Then I would really be a happy father. This is what God will tell each Jew when he die. The religious one, the non-religious one, <laughs> They don't know, they don't care about themselves, they care about others. Those who care about themselves, they're egoistic. What about your brothers? What about your cousins? Your parents? Your sons? If a person would know how critical it is to die wicked, Michalel Shabbat, they would stand in the street like all these people who demonstrate against this, against that, all these union people, they walk in the street in the freezing weather. For what? For 50 cents, gasoline a year, whatever, stupid tax. Uh, some politician wants to change the law of cigarettes, whatever. They give their life for this. They do it, and we don't care about our brothers and sisters. I'm telling you from experience. Those DVDs, Baruch Hashem, that I had the merit to make them. I didn't really make them. I just spoke. The people who made them, they work a lot harder. The people behind the scenes always do the dirty job, but they don't get enough credit for it. But in Olam Abba, everybody gets the right credit. And the people who sponsor, without them, they wouldn't, have, wouldn't be here. That's what it means to be a kosher son to our Father in Heaven. So the Torah says, when a wicked person makes repentance from all his sins, Chayo lo yamut. 
he would live in this life and in the next life he will never die. Now I want to ask you a question. The non-religious Jews, they don't live. They live, they have nice cars. The Goim, they don't live. They live. Some of them to 90 years old. The dogs, the pigs, the birds, they don't live. They also live. But according to the Torah, it's right here. I didn't make it up. According to the Torah, God says, only the Jews who will make repentance from all their sins and be fully orthodox religious, they will live. What do we learn from this if we are a little bit clever? With very small IQ, five IQ. It's enough to understand this. No, I don't need 98. Five. It's right here in the bottom. I marked it with a line. This is what God says to us. Trust me. I'm not interested to kill the dead. I am interested that he will return from his evil way, that he should live. What do we learn from this? Black on white, no arguments. That if you're not religious, if you don't listen to God, every second of your life is not connected in your brain, you are actually dead mentally, spiritually you're dead. Yeah, it's okay, you move, you dance, you run, you eat, you sleep. The dogs also have it, the chimpanzees also have it. Chris and Ahmed also have it. They have it. The NBA players, so how, how nice they jump, they make millions of dollars, smile to the camera, they live, very happy, smiling. They also live, but that's not what God calls life. The life of the body is temporary, it's nothing, it's disposable, that's nothing. When God speaks about something, it's always eternal. Keep my mitzvot that you should live. Bottom line, if you don't keep, you are dead for me. How can you sleep at night after you see this? This, this is it, it's right here. That's why I like to bring the screen. I could have said it without the computer. Why? Because I know what's going to be tomorrow. You're all going to go to your friends, this crazy guy from New York, he's fanatic, he made up things. I never knew religion is like this. I thought, you know, you put a few dollars in a box, you're on Shabbat, you drive to your mother-in-law to eat shulent, and that's it. <laughs> Come on, Rabbi, I bring the kids to the synagogue. We live far. Torah says you should not create any fire. You're not allowed to start your car on Shabbat. So how will I get to the synagogue? Don't get to the synagogue all your life. That's what the Torah says. Pray at home. Why? You're not allowed to violate Shabbat. Not even one minute in the history. The Torah says, if Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah it's two days. In Israel, in the, in the exile. If one of the two days of Rosh Hashanah, one of them falls on Shabbat, we don't blow the shofar. The most important mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah is blowing the shofar. The Torah said this whole Rosh Hashanah is to blow the shofar. It's big secrets in it. If it falls on Shabbat, came the Chachamim, the rabbis, the Torah gave them authority to make decrees and laws. The Chachamim say, if on Shabbat you don't touch the shofar, but the Torah say you have to blow the shofar. The Chachamim say, absolutely not. How can it be? The answer is, the guy that's supposed to blow the shofar, accidentally, you know, with all the rush to come to the synagogue, he forgot the shofar at home. All of a sudden, Shabbat morning, where's the shofar? Oy, I didn't bring the shofar. It wasn't like today, you know. <laughs> Two minutes you get the shofar, you drive back to the house. Oh, people walk a long time. How will I get the shofar now? Guess what happened? He would violate the rules of Shabbat. He would run in the middle of the davening, where nobody knows, to bring the shofar. You're not allowed to carry things on a public territory on Shabbat. Not allowed to bring from the single territory to a private territory. It's one of the 39 restrictions on Shabbat. I don't have time to explain all the laws. You know, obviously we need ears to know all of it, but just to give you an idea, maybe in the next 2,000 years, one Jew out of the embarrassment from the community will not be able to pass the test and will run and bring the shofar under his jacket and will become chas once in the history. It's enough. Mechalel Shabbat, 
The entire Jewish world will not hear shofar for 2,000 years. Why? Chas v'shalom, one Jew will make one time Chilul Shabbat, and we do it a million times every Shabbat, out of ignorance. No, nobody knows. In the Holocaust, the Nazis used to make the trials on Shabbat. That was their fun. The judge is a Jew. The defendant is a Jew. The capos, the police, was Jews. Everyone was a Jew. The guy who writes the protocol is a Jew. And the audience in Machshimam is the Ger German Amalekim. That's how they used to be. One time they bring a woman. That's a real story that happened. When I heard this story, <laughs> I felt like fire is going into the heart. Real story that happened. It's famous. It's in many books. The woman, they caught her, blaming her for throwing bread to someone inside the camp. Jewish woman, old woman. They bring her into the courtroom on Shabbat. They ask her, are you the one who gave him the bread? She doesn't answer. Once, twice, three, four times, the judge is a Jew. He wants to help her out. You know, the Germans are looking. The German officer says, last time, the people from the crowd scream, Rachel, you were with us. You were not there that, that Shabbat. We are your witnesses. Answer. She doesn't make a beep. The, the Germans say to the judge, last chance. Yes, yes, no, you kill her. She doesn't answer. The Jew, the poor judge, said that sentence. They take her out. Her two sons coming on their knees. Mommy, what did you do? The Torah says, Ele mitzvot asher otam adam The Torah says, I gave you this mitzvot, the Torah, to live here and to live in the next life for eternity. The purpose of the Torah wasn't to make you die because of it. So if your life is in risk, you're allowed to violate Shabbat. That's why we take our pregnant wife to the hospital on Shabbat with a car. Or with a cab, whatever. Why? Life risk. Any high fever, hospital, Shabbat, no problem, drive. If you're a doctor, you walk with a cell phone to the synagogue on Shabbat. You get phone calls in the middle of the davening. Happens all the time. Life risk. Bris milah, circumcision, we let it on Shabbat. Because without it, you're not a Jew. There's a lot of things to learn, but... So the woman answered to her son, You're a fool! If I would speak, the guy, the Jew, who writes the protocol, would write on Shabbat, his life is less than mine! How could I talk? The Jew is writing on Shabbat! Two generations ago, her grandmother. Two Look how far we went. Look how deep we sank. Two generations ago. She made a mistake in the law, in the halacha. She had to talk. And the guy is allowed to write. And it's not a sin. No problem. She didn't know. She didn't go to yeshiva, you know, in the, in the camps. But look at her intention. She's willing to die that another Jew will not mechalel Shabbat once. No. This is, could be your grandmother. Who knows? So the Torah says, when the wicked person is returning from all his sins, all the sins that he made by keeping my laws, he would live every time the Torah duplicate the word one after the other, like mot yumat, mot is for this life, mavet in this life, death to this life, and that to the next life, which is much worse, which is eternity. Also, chayo ichye, life here and life in a world that it's long, forever. Chayo ichye, lo yamut, will never die. Spiritually, not physically. Physically, everybody dies 10 years more, 10 years less, it's nothing. It's nothing. People are running after this life like, like what's to do here? What's to do here? If really you analyze your life, if you're, not, if you're not connected to God, what do you do? Analyze your life. You look like another species in nature. You eat, you sleep, you have relations, you have babies, you go, you run, you fight for your money, you bury other people. What for? It's like another tiger in a zoo or in a, in a safari, in a jungle, whatever. For that, 
the creator made you intelligent and made you control in the creation to be another chimpanzee? If he wanted, you would make you that. So the answer is, would I be interested to kill the wicked people? No. I'm interested that they will return from their crooked ways that they should live. And when a righteous person will leave his righteousness, will become not religious, it also happens sometimes. Desires, jobs, the wife dragged him down, the parents gave him hard time, he wasn't strong enough, all kinds of reasons. And he did all these despicable sins that the wicked people are doing, all his righteousness will not be remembered. He lost everything. Imagine 50 years you keep, one day you said, the hell with this, I'm not interested. Take off your keeper, this 50, he lost everything. It's right here in front of you. Nothing will be remembered from him betraying me. He would die for eternity. Word by word I'm translating to you. And you're going to say, now listen to this, and I promise you it's the last minute, just listen to this. And you are saying to me, God, your ways are impossible. Listen, my children, the nation of Israel. My way is impossible. Your ways is impossible. Don't blame me for that. I gave you everything ready to go. It's not across the ocean, the Torah says. It's not in heaven to say who's going to bring it to us. It's right in your hand, a piece of cake. After the actions, follows the heart. You begin to do, you begin to love. You got married to a woman. In the beginning, you're not so attracted. You live with her a few months. You see her beauty, her personality, the greatness of her. You get to a point you cannot be a second without her. I see it all the time. You don't like food, you go to jail. They give you eggplants every day like I had in the army. Every day, eggplants, I want to die already. <laughs> Today, it's my favorite food. But morning eggplant, afternoon eggplant, night eggplant, eggplant like this, eggplant like this. In the end, today, we have six different kinds of eggplant salads. <laughs> Why? The Torah told you, I created you. I know how you are. When you begin to do something, every time you suffer a little bit less, until it gets to a point, ah, Shabbat. I swear to you, thousands of people, I'm not exaggerating, literally thousands, that became Shomer Shabbat from the lectures, from the website, from the DVDs. They always repeat the same sentence that is so sweet in my ears. I wait all week for Shabbat. This guy was a professional player, this guy had business, this guy was this, this guy was on a beach, you know. Chiloni, it's Chiloni everywhere, the same. All week. I can't wait until Shabbat. Shabbat goes out, we get depressed. That's it, is. that's a fact. I swear to you 100% on my life. It's a 100% fact. What happened? They all became crazy? The Torah already told you the psychology of the human being. After the, after the actions, follows the hearts. Do it. You get used to it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Therefore, I'm going to judge each one separately. Return from all your sins that it will not be a trap to you. Throw away your sin from yourself and create yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why you should die, the nation of Israel? Because I'm not interested to kill the dead. He's already dead. He should return, that he should live. Every time the Torah speaks about life, is life of eternity. I just hope, I gave everything I could, you know, what can I do? But I just hope that even some of you will be clever enough, that's it, to make a time out and begin to learn, buy the right books. First of all, I, I almost force you. Divineinformation.com. You have hundreds of lectures are waiting for you. When you're done with that, I have, I have guys, not exaggerating, one from Montreal and one from uh, one, 
סילברמן, רוברט סילברמן מ-פום פנסילבניה. He told me each lecture I watch three, four, five times. Hundreds of lectures, times four, five times. So because every time when I listen, I see other things that I didn't see in the previous times. And people in life, some of them didn't know anything. 40, 30, 50, everyone, when you find the truth, it's like a baby that was born. It can be 60 years old. You don't know Aleph Bed. You don't know how to say Shema Israel. So the first rule is before you go to sleep every night, you take a Jewish Sidur. You say Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. It's in the Sidur. Look for the Shema. It takes two minutes. And then after that, you begin to talk to Hashem. Dear God, I found you tonight, last night, a week ago. It doesn't matter. Help me out to get out of the darkness. The Torah said there are two kinds of people who live in the dark. Two kinds of people who live in the dark. So why the Torah says there are two kinds of people? It's one category, not two. Because one already found out that he's in the darkness. It's a big step forward. If you know you're sick, you have a chance to cure yourself. It may be painful. It may be hard work. But you have a chance to live. The other guy is still smoking his cigar, sitting in his office, thinking he's on the top of the world. Tomorrow he'll find out that it's too late for him. Who is more miserable after the lecture? The guy who found out the truth. The guy who didn't come to the lecture, tomorrow will go to play golf on Shabbat with a cigar. He's convertible and his beautiful young girlfriend, 55 years old, younger than him, <laughs> still live in a movie. With his white tuxedo, comes to the show, he thinks like, God put me here to be a movie star. That's what people are thinking. He learned from this guy and from the other movie and from this newspaper. No. Who is more miserable, really? The one who smiles with the golf. He is more miserable. He is going to smile for another 10 years. It's a blink of the eye anyway. What's going to be after he comes naked, empty pocket? What did you do in your life? Gurnish, nothing. Well, all one big balloon, illusion. The other one, who was a little bit upset, and he worked very hard to correct his life, he made it. He learns Torah. Say to God, help me out. I don't know how to start. First start, you go into the website. It's guaranteed. You listen to the lectures. You listen to Shabbat. We didn't speak five minutes about Shabbat. I have a two and a half hours lecture explaining Shabbat from A to Z. Everything. You listen to this, you'll never dare to be Mechalel Shabbat. Never. For a million dollar Shabbat, you wouldn't agree. Why you are doing it today? Only one reason, ignorance. No other. The same thing, life after life. Don't you want to know what's going to be after life in details? Everybody wants to know. Then you want to know about correcting your personality. Marriage, how to make it work. All the psychologists that tell you watch dirty movies to improve your life with your husband or with your life with, with, your, with your wife, they all commit suicide the year after. Look at their psychologists, what happened with them, the statistic. All these psychos will give you uh, all kinds of uh, recommendations against God and you were going to listen to them and pay them $300 an hour when the Torah is free of charge on the shelf. You don't bother to open it once. That's stupidity. No other word. That's ignorance. No, stupidity is not the right word. Ignorance. He, know, he doesn't know. He thinks. Bialik wrote the Torah. Bialik. Shakespeare, maybe. I don't know. No. The Torah was written by the creator of the world. Torah means in Hebrew instruction, or in front of millions of witnesses. The world was rocking, shaking. 70 languages the Torah was translated to right away. It's affected any civilization in the world. Every place in the world, they follow the Ten Commandments. The Goim call us the nation of the book, Am Asefer. Muhammad made us this title. Muhammad in the Quran, Am Asefer. The nation of the famous book. And we are the Jews there to say, prove to me that God gave us the Torah. It's like saying, prove to me that Napoleon really lived. <laughs> Millions of people are speaking about it, drawing him, telling stories about him. It's a fact. It's all over the world. I'm willing to swear that the China exists. 
I've never been in China, but I'm putting my life on the line. China exists. <laughs> Can you deny that China exists? No. But the Torah, I must deny. Because if I agree with you, Rabbi, what are you going to tell me tomorrow? How didn't you put fill in? I'm going to start live with a conflict. That's what I call in Hebrew matzpun. Matzpun, it's conscious. It's very similar to the word matzpen, campus, that shows the right direction. It's very interesting, the, the, the divine language. If I have a whole lecture, I never give it, because it's a very long lecture. The secret, I'm not afraid of long lectures, but this one is really long. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, just the beauty of the language is sweeter than honey. Anyway, like I say, let's remember the final conclusion. Begin to talk to God in your language. You may not know what to do, how to do. Help me out. Send me the right messengers. Help me find a job. Help me to find a kosher wife. Help me with children. Help me to find these. Help me to, do, help me to get closer to you. I really want to be righteous. But I'm so far from the target. Without you, I cannot make two steps. King David was begging every second of his life, retail him. The righteous person in history, what was he busy doing all day? Show me your way, show me your path, show me how to get close to you. My soul is anxious, I'm thirsty to you. Help me, help me with my enemies. And we, we are far from Hashem, like another galaxy. Not once, help me, show me, I'm okay. That's okay, Rabbi, I'm, I'm first row in a VIP in heaven. First row. Don't worry. I don't take drugs. I give the synagogue $5 a month. What's the problem? <laughs> Every Jew is sure. I am the first row in Olam Abba. Somehow I have a feeling that the VIP in Olam Abba won't have too many people. So many people are happy, I'm sure they have a VIP ticket. But in the back of the ticket it says, Kol Yisrael esh lo chelek laolam haba, the Torah says. Every Jew is born with a ticket to the world to come. What they don't know is the rest of the Mishnah, the rest of the verse. And those are the Jews who does not have a part to the world to come. Why they don't know it? Because we took it out of the prayers. We don't want to say negative things in the prayers about ourselves. So we only took half of the Mishnah. כל ישראל יש להם חלק לעולם הבא. Every חילוני, this knows by heart. He knows it by heart. Before he's born, he knows one pasuk. כל ישראל חלק יש... Are you telling me I'm not going to have a part of the world to come because I'm not Shomer Shabbat? Here, I'll tell you what they taught us in school. כל ישראל יש להם חלק לעולם הבא. Every Jew has a part of the world to come. Yes, my friend. Go, continue another second to read. And those are the ones who don't have a part of the world to come. Someone who denied that the Torah is from Hashem. Someone who say one word in the Torah is not from God. That's all. Keep Shabbat. But he dared to say the Torah is not 100% divine. Or he say Moshe is a liar. Moshe is a false prophet. He modified the Torah. He wrote the Torah. Or he learns other religions because he wants to follow it. And he makes sins in public, he does not have a part of the world to come. Those, this part people don't know. The back of the ticket says there are some conditions. No sneakers, you want to enter the club? No sneakers, no jacket, no jeans, no cigarettes, no gel in the hair, no earrings. It's a classy place, my friend. You cannot enter like this. What do you mean? I pay $300 for the ticket. No. You didn't read the back of the ticket. A, B, C, D. You did it, you are welcome. You didn't do it, you stay outside forever. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure being here tonight. Thank you.